Right, fantastic. So good morning, everyone. So today we're going to cover, um, you know, the topic is cryptocurrency and decentralized finance on your course syllabus, I think. But um, uh, recently, uh, I was uh, asked to give a keynote speech at a research conference between Jolongon Business School and Nanyang Business School on uh, blockchain and finance. Um, you know, what is blockchain about? Why is it related to finance? And more importantly, what are the kind of research topics people are doing um, related to that? So I thought I'll share that with you today so that you might, you might be able to use this as a, as a starting point to get some ideas about what potential research topics you can, you know, you can uh, look into when you want to go to, toward your SP or thesis. Okay, so my name is Azan Kanip, and I've um, been part of this uh, department for 10 years. And um, I do a lot of uh, research on um, you know, various topics in the financial um, markets. <coughs> Uh, especially toward uh, debt. I, I started my PhD journey in 2019, right after the global financial crisis. So naturally, I was one of you know, the young grad students who were interested in looking further into what were the causes and the, and the uh, insights from the great financial crisis. So my um, thesis was actually in real estate finance, like mortgages, how subprime crises happen, um, how real estate is priced and so on. And when I got here, I, I was also uh, asked to you know, teach corporate finance, uh, financial modeling. And around that time, there were new um, innovations coming in, uh, like alternative ways of raising funds, like SPACs and so on. So you know, I, my research interest gravitated toward that as well. But in 2020 onward, when we were locked down at home, a lot of us were interested in blockchain and words like decentralized finance and so on started coming onto the scene. So today I'm gonna to share with you the journey um, that I, I took into decentralized finance and blockchain and reflect the kind of questions being asked around that point in time and how that evolved over time. And I'll try to put that into context with the academic research being done okay, around that point in time as well. So in 2020, 2021, these kind of articles were being circulated around um, the, the financial circles. For example, right hand side, we have a blog by Chris Skinner, who is an avid observer of banking and financial tech, fintech, right? He wrote an article in October 2020, will DeFi destroy banking? Okay, DeFi is abbreviated from decentralized finance. And that's a term used to describe financial services being offered via blockchain. And blockchain, many of you will be familiar with Bitcoin and so on. A blockchain is one of the, one of the innovations that um, allowed alternative ways of providing financial services to, 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 to the world, right? On the left-hand side, we also have articles like this. I think this was from, from a Cointelegraph. Cointelegraph is a crypto media, okay? So better, faster, cheaper, how DeFi will kill the retail bank. In fact, I got interested in this because in, in December, one of, our, one of my um, um, uh, students, okay, one of my ex-students, um, you know, we, we met up for, for a dinner and then he told me that, by the way, Ajahn, you should look into this because uh, one of his you know, family members made a lot of money in decentralized finance, okay, buying and selling these coins. And I'm like, is this like Bitcoin? Because we've seen Bitcoin for a long time. He said, no, this time is very different. Okay, in 2020, we have a lot more um, exciting things are happening in that space. So that was when I got interested. And in early 2021, there were uh, seminars being organized for financial educators in Thailand. And one of the topics that was, um, was uh, raised at that point in time was um, what is DeFi and will DeFi exactly like this, like destroy banking. Narratives going down um, the, the street back then was uh, you need to look into DeFi because the, the world will be different. Okay, banks are, are not necessary. Okay, but banking services are. This narrative has been repeated many, many times already throughout history, but they say this time it might be different. So you might want to look into this because you don't, you don't want to end up on the wrong side of history. Okay, so being a researcher that I am, I got curious and I started looking into what is blockchain uh, really about, despite it being around for a long time already. And then uh, what is DeFi uh, doing and how what we, what we can learn from this. So, um, how many of you visit ATM machines nowadays? You do? 
You do? Okay, cool. What do you visit ATM machines for? Cash? Okay. Do you visit ATM machines more or less frequently compared to say five, six years ago in your, in your memory? Less? That's, that's probably because uh, you know, there are other ways of paying okay, money that uh, is a lot more convenient. Okay? But the reason why we have, credit, why we have um, ATMs and credit cards is that um, some forms of money that we own okay, are quite difficult to spend. If you look back throughout you know, history, okay, there are various methods that we use to make payments. And payments are simply you know, an act of, um, well, an act of transacting, I guess. Okay? You want access to goods and services. And what do you do without barter? You pay with something society calls money. And that's as good as settling the debt and settling the obligations. So throughout history, we have things like gold coins. Okay? We have things like bank notes because gold coins is too cumbersome to carry around. So we use bank notes instead, more value dense, so to speak, right? You know, the, the, um, the physical um, burden that's being placed on you uh, to carry a representation of some value around. It gets more convenient when you, when you have um, you know, a transformation of how you represent value. So we have um, banknotes that allow us to pay for a lot of value while being very light and very easy to carry around. Okay? We have um, checks. Checks allow you to pay for things that um, today, okay, with money, you potentially don't own yet. Okay, because you can actually say that um, to, to, to the bearer of this check, you can cash a check in on, on so-and-so date. And that date may not be today. Okay, so you can actually delay payments. In, in fact, checks and credit cards are quite similar. Okay, but you know, the way the money is being um, settled might be a bit different. But conceptually, it's a delayed payment, like a delayed payment mechanism. And then fast forward to today, you can pay with mobile banking applications. And mobile banking applications are just an interface. Okay, within that mobile banking application, there are many ways for you to make payments. You can make, you can make payments with money you own today, and you can make payment with payments with money you don't own yet, okay? but you probably pay in the future. For example, you know, we, we talked about credit cards and checks already. Today, we have like buy now, pay later. Okay, these are mechanisms that allow you to pay with money of different forms, money uh, that uh, you do or don't own yet. And that's basically um, you know, our financial system. Long story short, there are many things in the world today that we call money, okay? But um, despite there are many things that we call money, we pay with um, any forms that we want as long as society accepts it as money. You get your coffee, okay? You'll get your Netflix subscription. They'll be happy to take uh, that, for that form money if they like. So, Western Union. Anyone familiar with the original history of Western Union? What service do they offer? And today, they kind of give away a little bit, right? Their, their motto is like moving money for better. And um, it's like send money, receive money. But prior to sending and receiving money, anyone know what Western Union did for business? Anyone familiar with the term telegraph? Telegraph is like sending SMS in the old days, okay? Where you don't have uh, mobile devices with you. You send an SMS to a telegraph branch, and then you can pick up a printed SMS, okay? And it's still, we call it SMS as well because they will charge you by the characters, okay? The longer message you want to send, the more money, okay, you have to pay to them. Okay? The thing is, when you send Telegraph, you send messages. What if that message contains a payment order? Okay, I'm going to pay you 100 bucks. That is an SMS. But the, the, what you really want that accompany the SMS is, can I really get access to that 100 bucks? Okay, so when you send a telegraph uh, with, with uh, the payment instructions, if you're a telegraph company and you, you have funds in your control, you can actually disburse the funds for the clients. Okay? I can send an SMS to you in Chiang Mai. I, I give the, you know, I keep using SMS because nobody uses the word tele telegraph anymore, but let's use the word telegraph again. Okay, I send telegraph to Chiang Mai. I want to pay you who, who stay in Chiang Mai. I give uh, 100 baht to the telegraph company, and then they would, um, they would take that 100 baht 
with the payment instructions. You go to the branch in Chiang Mai, okay? And you've been told that I sent a message to you that I want to pay 100 baht. The telegraph company branch in Chiang Mai can disburse the funds out of their pocket. And they're okay because they already received 100 baht from me, maybe in Bangkok. And now they're in possession of that 100 baht. And they can disburse that 100 baht that they own, but in a different location okay, to you in Chiang Mai, for example. That's actually how money transfers work since ancient history. Now, if, you, if you were following like Chinese um, period drama and so on, you would see that all these merchants, traders, or even, even um, you know, um, fighters, they would carry um, paper forms of money. So you would deposit the gold coins in one uh, money um, exchange branch. You get a paper certificate. You go to a new town, you exchange that paper certificate with money of the equivalent value, but they're not the same coins, okay? They're not the same objects anymore. But as long as they represent the same value, society's okay with that. Sometimes you call that the fungibility of money, okay? We don't really care which bank note you give me, as long as it's authentic and it's 100 baht. It is 100 baht, I can buy a cup of coffee. That's fine. But the thing I wanna highlight here is that why do we need transfer agents like this? Because when we say money, the forms of money that we really care about, just like uh, the ATM machine um, gives you access to cash, is because so sometimes when we want to spend our money, they have a very, very specific form of money they want to receive. You couldn't spend your bank account balance easily prior to PromPay. But now with PromPay, you can directly spend your bank balance. Previously, you had to use cash as the intermediary to actually transfer that value. This can be very cumbersome. And one of the reasons why payments, international payments, cross-border payments, um, takes time and also takes, um, takes uh, money, additional expense, is because you know, you're, you're converting across different forms of money. So I was teaching in um, Indonesia in early September so they were kind enough to give me um, a speaker's fee for that. You know, as instantly I, was, I was teaching blockchain as well. Okay. So they made a payment to me via bank transfers. It took 21 days okay, for that bank transfer to arrive in Thailand. Okay. Even though Indonesia and Thailand is you know, pretty close and it's electronic. You send SMS, you send email, it gets in your inbox almost immediately. But why can't we send text messages and emails um, that, that contain things like money and have that money be delivered in our wallet, in our bank account immediately. It turns out there are certain you know, um, restrictions, uh, there are certain um, frictions in a way that financial system operates. So that's why the system today is still not as efficient as sending money via SMS or emails and, why, and the reason why we need transfer agents like this is to try to communicate across okay, different networks, different forms of money. Okay, so you can read more into how international transfer works um, in, in various documents. I'm just lifting out a page from the World Economic Forum report on the future of finance, and that was written in 2015. Okay, almost 10 years on, our world still works in very much the same way. There's also um, a lot of YouTube videos uh, on, on um, how international money transfers work. So I refer to those resources instead. But in the gist, it works a lot like how Telegram, I told you, uh, uh, work. It works a lot like how the money uh, exchange companies in, in ancient Chinese history works. But uh, it perhaps gets a bit more complicated when you start asking whose money are we trying to spend? I'm going to bring you back to crypto, blockchains, and so on, and take you to 2008. Okay, 2008 is when the global financial crisis or the subprime crisis happened. So, you know, from my introduction to you, you already heard that I was interested in real estate finance because of global financial crisis, because one of the catalysts, not catalysts, sorry, one of the uh, sparks that um, you know lit the whole thing up was a real estate market, okay? We had like financial innovations like credit default swap, synthetic CDOs and so on that kind of acted as a catalyst and blow the whole thing up. So if you haven't watched the, the big short already, um, I recommend that you do so. Once you have um, 
background in finance or some uh, familiarity with some concepts, uh, it hits you quite differently when you watch the big shot as someone who, who is uh, familiar with financial terms. But one of the outcomes of that global financial crisis was that a lot of financial institutions were affected. Okay, so what I'm showing you is Northern, Northern Rock, which is like a bank in UK. And you see people queuing up in front of the bank. Can you guess why they queue up in front of the bank? You draw money, right? You go to banks for several reasons. You might go there to get loans and so on. But if you go there in droves, chances are you might be going there to withdraw money. And when you draw, withdraw money, any bank, cannot survive, okay? If everyone wants to withdraw their money at once, no bank in the world can survive because you know from the balance sheet of the bank that on the right-hand side, they have liabilities, like deposits are liabilities. And if someone comes and withdraw the money, it's, a, it's equivalent to your creditor asking for repayment. The banks also have assets, but their assets are illiquid. You know, they might be investing in some uh, government financial instruments, that's great. You know, that's quite liquid, but if you want to sell things in bulk, it can get complicated. But most of the bank's assets are actually invested in loans, okay, like real sector loans, giving out loans to hotels, giving out loans to factories and so on. And you can't demand repayments on that easily. So when you have this asset liability mismatch, then catastrophe can happen. So a lot of banks were in trouble. Um, banks needed to be bailed out. In Thailand, we had similar kinds of crises in 1997. Okay? The cost might be a bit different, okay? but in the end, most of the time, it's this asset liability mismatch that is inherent in the bank, that if someone withdraws in mass, no bank can survive. Okay? So like, there have been Nobel Prizes awarded for um, researchers who look into the causes of bank runs like this and so on. But I'm going to skip that and talk about... Um, one of the narratives being provided why we have decentralized finance and cryptocurrency and blockchain is because when these banks fail, somebody's got to step in. Governments usually step in to, to bail out these banks because when banks fail, um, our lives can be affected by that. So that's like a, 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 a saying in the United States um, for banking and financial services, they would use Wall Street to represent that. Okay. And then for real sector, like, you know, businesses doing their everyday jobs, they will call that Main Street. So there's a tension between Wall Street and Main Street, that when Wall Street um, fails, it might spill over into the Main Street. So throughout history, there have been times and times again where governments step in and help bail out financial sectors to make sure that the catastrophe doesn't really um, spill over into the real sector. So in Thailand, we also had very similar situations where we closed out a lot of financial companies and then consolidated them into, into a, a financial institution so that they're strong enough to survive. Okay. So as a result of that bailout, more importantly, the bank executives, uh, they didn't really suffer that much. Um, somebody uh, wrote about this episode that perhaps only one bank executive went to jail Okay? And then most other bank executives were still rewarded with their annual bonus, a lot of bonus. They got really rich. Okay? But the, the customers, a lot of them were burnt. So there's a, a wave of dissentment fomenting in the United States. I remember when I was in the United States, the, the, when I was doing my PhD, there was a time where we had protests, like the 1% protest. People would go out to Wall Street, to that, um, to that raging bull statue, Okay, that's meant to, to symbolize the, the bull markets okay, in Wall Street. So they'll go out and then hold out protest sign that you know, um, um, these 1%, um, they are taking advantage of the 99% of the, of the um, economy. Okay? So people want to change. And when people want to change, they wanted alternatives. So this is where FinTech and so on that we heard of today started getting momentum. In fact, the word FinTech wasn't really uh, talked uh, about until after this financial crisis. It spurred a new kind of um, financial services that are offered by institutions that are not deposit-taking institutions like banks. And around the same time, Halloween night um, in 2008, a message was posted in this mailing list. Okay? A mailing list in terms of today's equivalent is a bit like line open chat, where you don't have to review who you are. But to take it a little bit further, 
And when you post things in line open chat, line still knows who you are, right? Just the participants don't really know who you are. But uh, this is a this is a more like I would say decentralized way of communicating. There's really no central party like line to organize all these messages. It's just an open web bot, okay? That people can post without revealing um, who they are. Well, he revealed himself as or or or, or themselves as uh, Satoshi at Visto Mail as a way to communicate too. But these emails, you don't really know who's behind them. Yeah, you don't even know who Satoshi Nakamoto is or are, but that's fine. But the thing we want to focus on is that the message being posted to this, to this mailing list is a message about Bitcoin P2P, P2P eCash paper. Satoshi said, I've been working on a new electronic cash system that's fully P2P and no trusted third party. And I want to highlight in a few words, okay? Cash. When you spend cash, nobody needs to know who you are, okay? And the cash is cash because people know it's not counterfeited, okay? So if you want to move this to the online system, we face a few challenges. The first challenge is in the online system, you need to put information into the database. So do they know who you are? Sometimes, and most of the times, okay, the database administrator knows who you are. They may not ask you to reveal yourself to the participants in the ecosystem, but at least the administrator will probably have the ability to demand you to reveal who you are. Okay? And secondly, when you spend digital cash, how do you know that cash isn't copy and pasted? And we call this a double spending problem. We don't, we don't want to have a digital duplication of the same thing. Just like you can't photocopy your bank note and then spend it. Okay? You shouldn't be able to photocopy your digital money and then spend it again as well. Okay, so that's about how to prove the authenticity of the object that represents money. That is not fake uh, paper bill. That is not fake gold coin. So here are the things that Satoshi said, the main properties, double spending is prevented by blah, blah. Participants can also be anonymous, okay? And the money inside that is being generated, they call it coin, okay? There are various mechanisms to make sure how it is created, okay? And that the, the coin being created is authentic. So those are the key things I want to take away from here. Another key word I want to highlight is no trusted third party. So there is always going to be a third party because a database, there needs to be a database administrator or owner. Okay? But the key word is no trusted. That means you don't need to trust them. Who do you need to trust in current society? You have to trust that banks keep your balances uh, intact, right? that, that they don't just deduct money from you. Okay? You need to trust them that you're able to spend your money when you do that prompt, when you do that prompt pay transfer you want to make sure that your account isn't barred, your account isn't shut off by the banks, that you have access to that. Um, you know, numbers represent your money at all times, okay? If you want to take this one more step, you can also think about what are we actually spending? We're spending Thai baht. The Thai baht is authorized by the Thai government as a country, okay? So if they say that this money is good, okay? then money, this money is good. So what if we don't want to rely on that a national authority that has the ability to direct which currency that we use? That can also be interpreted all the way okay, to that ex ex extent as well. So Satoshi crea uh, suggests creating a digital information system where you have numbers in that system representing coins and that coins can be called Bitcoin and that Bitcoin can have its own exchange rate versus other goods and services or even other currencies around the world. Okay, so that's why sometimes, um, you know, um, commentators, they'll call this coin like a cryptocurrency. I'll start with the currency first because it's a new unit that is not directly tied to any other currencies in the world. A currency is a system of money that represents how we judge values. So this number is an independent system. So some will call this a currency, okay? Others may disagree because a currency may have like a nation state kind of, you know, um, um, affiliation toward it, but that's fine. 
But crypto, okay, the word crypto comes from cryptography. That means that encrypting things into, into um, secrets so that you don't want to show um, your content to other people. So privacy is a main theme that being represented here. And the way to preserve privacy is to encrypt messages. You know, in families, in each family, we probably have, you probably have your own like secret code that you know within your family. Imagine visiting um, a relatives at a relatives gathering, okay? And, and you kind of, you think that you should go already, okay? You might have a secret code among your family that if we say this, then we know it's time to go. Okay. That's cryptography. Okay. You say one thing, it means another thing. So nobody actually knows the true meaning behind that. And you can take that one step further. You can, you can encrypt your message into jumbles. So nobody even knows what this reads like. Okay. But inside, there is a meaningful content behind it. Only reserved for those who are deserving of this information. So I'm going to skip all the technical details. So I'm going to show you, okay, after that, like you can say white paper, a working paper circulation in Halloween night, 2008. In January, 2009, this system was put in place. And when this system was put in place, um, the system administrator, presumably Satoshi, also attached a little memo to the first transaction in this database. They attach a memo that reads times 3rd of January, 2009, chance of the brink of second bailout for banks. So you can interpret this on many levels. Okay? The first level could be, I need to prove to the world that this database was created on this day. How do I know that? Well, if you may suspect that I put in a wrong timestamp in the database, because after all, if I create a database, right, I can actually artificially put in any data I want as a starting day. So you might be suspicious of that. So just like in investigative movies, you have to create an alibi. If you are a suspect of something, you have to create an alibi that I was here on this day and this day. So you see in those movies, you would, you would see um, um, people who want to create alibi will be taking pictures of themselves with uh, you know, a newspaper with a headline on that day and maybe with a public clock somewhere so that you know that this timestamp is not being doctored or faked. Okay. So on a, on a surface level, you can think of this as creating an alibi as a proof that this database was not created before the 3rd of January. It would have been impossible to create this database because otherwise you'd be a time traveler. You would know information that happens in the future and you put it in today. Okay, so we know this database comes on or after, okay, 3rd of January. And the second, the choice of headline could be a choice of headline that declares a message that Banks fail, governments have to come in and bail out, and government money comes from taxpayers' money. So if uh, we want to express our resentment of government action, what better way to actually put in a headline that express, um, you know, that, that, uh, that captures what governments do with taxpayers' money. Bail out banks and banks are ex executives. So in this database, it contains just few information, okay? It contains the amount of coins, okay? It contains the uh, direction of coins where it's been transferred to. And I want to point out the word Coinbase, okay? The word Coinbase here is a technical name in Bitcoin database that represents coins being created by the database. So one of the genius inventions of this Bitcoin mechanism is that it creates a system that incentivizes people to come and then help check the transactions, help check the state of the blockchain. So I haven't really told you yet, how do we get a system that doesn't rely on a trusted third party? So we do need third parties, but we don't need to trust them, okay? Because that third party should be a decentralized network of computers that will be recording past transactions Okay. And will also be asked to, to um, propose future transactions. So think about what happens when you transfer money via prompt pay. You log into the application. Okay, you specify who you want to send money to. And then you specify the amount. You're actually sending a message, an SMS or a telegram, okay? telegraphs, so to speak. And then... And then um, 
the person who receives the message to process instructions. Okay. So the decentralized network not only just contains information of what has happened in the past, it also needs to propose new transactions, like new requests to spend money. So the system is built in a way that the computer that participate, we're gonna call them nodes, just like you know, a, network, a, a node of a, of a network. So nodes who compete and a node that wins will get the right to pick the transactions that are being requested by the users of the system. So suppose all of you have requested a transfer and um, I win. I can pick and choose which transfers I want to process. And the transfers I want to process will then be uh, collected and then put into, a, into you know, a list of transactions I want to do and then contain in the database as a block. And the reason why we call this blockchain is because data is, is uh, recorded in blocks and then blocks are chained um, together from the past to the present and then a future block will be added at the end. So that's why we call this data structure a blockchain data structure. Okay, so broadly speaking, blockchain um, refers to just data structure, okay? But in the specific usage in uh, financial applications, it means a data structure that actually allows us to have a decentralized network, okay? And you also need to have other mechanisms that go with it. For example, who gets, okay, who gets the right to propose new transactions? Who, who is a node that wins? So we call this broadly speaking, a consensus mechanism or consensus algorithm to determine that if all of us who are, who are nodes or data centers want to propose new, new blocks, how do we know which block we want to pick out of many, many alternatives, okay? So that's a brief description of how this works and all those involve some forms of cryptography. Bitcoin mining is essentially a uh, um, consensus mechanism to make sure that we, we agree on who is the winner, okay? And then we can also um, validate and so on and so on. The point is, uh, this system was put in place on 3rd of January, 2029. And okay, you can have numbers in the system. When do numbers become money? When you try to spend it for something, okay? You can you know, loosely start thinking about that as money. So in 2010, May 22nd, 2010, a programmer, Laszlo Hanyek, okay, and was posting earlier that I have a lot of Bitcoin. Okay, so I want, to, uh, I want to spend this Bitcoin somehow. So it, does anyone want to send me pizzas, two pizzas? Okay, I'll give you 10,000 Bitcoin. So Laszlo Hanyek reported, I want to report that I successfully traded 10,000 Bitcoins of pizza. It's a proof. Okay. We're spending that Bitcoin simply means can you tell me where to transfer my Bitcoin to? Okay, I will transfer Bitcoin to you, 10,000 units. And you can verify this. Now, we'll, show, we'll show you later how we can verify this. And once the Bitcoin has been transferred, the pizza company, or I don't even, I don't know enough details whether it's a pizza company or someone who just goes out and buy pizza for him. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, but if Laszlo Hanyek was happy with receiving two, two large pies of pizza with 100, 100, uh, 10,000 Bitcoins, that is a transaction that's completed. Okay. So if you're not too um, serious about what defines money, um, Bitcoin was the money, quote unquote, okay, in that transaction. If you think broadly, okay, money has a lot of other properties that you may want to think about. And one obvious thing is that you don't want to regret spending money for something okay, because you overspent. People always regret spending money, okay? but it's because what we spend money for, uh, the goods and services we receive doesn't really meet our expectations. So that's a kind of like, you know, um, marketing, um, a lot of marketing research on this. How do we um, minimize bias remorse so that when we buy say the new Apple mini and then we get Apple mini, we feel like, why the hell did I just buy an Apple mini? Okay, that's a different kind of regret. So this regret would be, okay, you know, the Bitcoin price today. So that would be one kind of regret that you may have for spending this Bitcoin rather than keeping this Bitcoin. In that case, um, Bitcoin will not work very well as something you want to spend anymore. Okay, it will work well as a you know and and uh, a form of investment, maybe. Okay, but 
my point is that going back to the original purpose of this network, this network was meant to allow you to spend some form of wealth in a way that you don't need the, you know, the, the networks that we use today. Okay. We don't have to trust one another because we can verify what is going on in the blockchain. Okay. And if everybody accepts what's being recorded on the blockchain as the state of wealth, like you, know, you own the 10,000 Bitcoin, I own two Bitcoin, great. Okay, we can reconcile the balances of Bitcoin that we have in the network and agree on the state of our money, of our wealth. But Bitcoin wasn't really created because of global financial crisis. Why? You see a keyword there, right? Anonymity, okay? privacy. The fact that Satoshi Nakamoto didn't even disclose who they were is already reflects that they value privacy over all else. So in the 1990s, this kind of cartoon was very popular. On the internet, nobody knows your dog. Why? Because when you want to go on the internet in the 1990s, when it first came out, they didn't ask for any form of identification. Okay. Maybe you have IP address, okay, but the internet service providers weren't obliged to disclose who were using, okay, who were behind those internet IP addresses. So whatever you do online, okay, you, can, you can do and say whatever you want. Okay, but fast forward to today, whatever you do online, they know. Okay? And, and they, they meet has a very broad meaning. It can be companies, it can be, it can be government. So they know what's going on. Okay. So if we go back, I'm going to skip this. Okay. I'm going to skip this. If you go back to 1993, this was right around the day where internet was about to take, out, take off. Okay. There's a group of programmers who call themselves cypherpunk. Okay. Cypher is about encryption. Okay. And punk means some um, like, in terms of today's language, or maybe not today's, like my generation language, like the alternative, like the author, like that kind of thing, right? You want to be like rebel against the system. So cypherpunk are individuals advocating widespread use of strong cryptography and privacy enhancing tech as a route to social and political change. In 1993, Eric Hughes, one of the face of the cypherpunk um, uh, movement, he came out with a cypherpunk manifesto talking about things that they value, and um, if you want to pick out the things that they value, they have, uh, number one, and these are programmers, okay? So they write the codes, okay? And the codes that they write, they want to make it open source, that everyone, any work can use. And the reason why they say that is because they are programmers who work in cryptographic methods, okay? To improve privacy and communication. And anytime a researcher works on technology that has national security implication, like, Cryptography, like um, quantum mechanics, like nuclear physics, okay? The government says you are dangerous or your tech is dangerous. So we monitor you or we'll take away your tech. I have friends who work in physics, like in a particle physics. When he travels around the world, he has to tell the government first where he goes. Okay? There's someone watching where he goes because uh, the government deems he's too dangerous with the knowledge that he has. Okay. So cryptographic um, knowledge okay, can keep us private, okay, but it can also be misused for malicious things. So anytime someone who comes up with cryptographic technologies, most of the time government takes it away. And programmers who came up with these are not happy. So they said, in that case, if you want to take it away, let's make it open source. Okay. Once you put it out on the internet, open source, anyone can copy and use it. So you can take it away all you want, but a program, once you copy, you can always run on your system. Okay. Many of you may be familiar with BitTorrent. Okay. BitTorrent is a decentralized network. You cannot shut BitTorrent down. You may be able to shut BitTorrent traffic down, okay? but you cannot shut the BitTorrent protocol because it's an open source protocol. If anyone installs it, it, is, it will run. Okay. So in a way, Bitcoin is a bit like BitTorrent, but instead of sharing the files, you share the ledger, the balances, the transactions that happen so that we know this is the version of transactions that happen. And this, these transactions represent money being transferred. We have a decentralized network of computers around the world that can show who owns what or who transacted with whom, okay? Privately, because we can actually 
we can also require participants or, or don't require participants to actually disclose anything. Okay. So that was DevCon earlier this week. This one of the sessions in DevCon as well, modern cypherpunk. So you can see the kind of words that they put on the screen. Okay. Private communications, anonymity. And you know, in the in the cyberspace, you cannot be truly anonymous. Why? Because there's a way to trace you. Okay. But if that if that way of tracing you doesn't really identify you personally, you're still relatively anonymous speaking, so to speak. But on the flip side, once you start identifying who you are, just like Laszlo Hanyek, he spent that 10,000 Bitcoin. So we know the address that spent that 10,000 Bitcoin, it belongs to him. Okay. So once you give away who you are, then you know, they will know who you are. That's what pseudonymity means. Other words, okay, anti-censorship, and so on and so on. So you can think about a money network that has censorship rules built inside. In fact, that's how the world the international transfer network, the official one, okay, works anyway. The list that say US government says, um, if you're on this list, uh, the whole world should not transact with you. Because if the world transact with you and, and you know, on that list is a US government hated list, okay, uh, the government will also hate you as well. US government also hate you. Okay. So narratives like this have been around for a long time. In 1994, um, there was an article in Wired Magazine. The Wired Magazine was the hottest okay, tech magazine in the world back then. Well, when I say world, I mean United States and you know, tech world, United States is almost synonymous. This so article that came out, it says e-money. Hey, e-money, that's what I want. Okay? The killer application for these electronic networks, um, the internet. Okay? Isn't video on demand? Now, we talked about video on demand in 1994 already. Okay? It's going to hit you where it really matters. It's in your wallet. It's how you spend money. How can you spend money just like sending SMS, like sending emails? In fact, uh, one of the startups that Elon Musk co-founded, okay, not PayPal, but X.com. Okay, he founded X.com. Well, the mission of X.com was to make sending money like sending email. You can even go back and then look on the Internet Archive of the screenshot of X.com. <laughs> it looks like sending email. Okay. So that was the narrative back in 1990s about how to revolutionize the internet, how to revolutionize the world, because despite money already being digitally represented, the way that it's being spent isn't like an open network. It's like, you know, um, fence network. Just like when you watch Netflix, okay, you can't watch content in South Korea, for example, even though it's in the internet, but there's a fence somehow that prevents you okay, from watching content outside Thailand. Money is the same. Even though money is digital, okay, there are some fences around how money can be spent. And in one corner of the world, they want to break down that fence. And that's okay, the, the, the narratives behind this e-money. There's also about... You know, we also see the terms about government censorship and so on. And this is embedded in the Bitcoin narrative as well. So every year there's a conference, Bitcoin Thailand, okay, organized by Bitcoin, um, a big Bitcoin proponents in Thailand. And, um, you know, you can go watch this on YouTube, actually. They live stream this. So I was, I was watching the live stream on that day as well, on day two session. Okay, um, so there are various talks, various topics and so on. But the common theme about... Um, you know, blockchain-based uh, financial system or you know, uh, cryptocurrency um, proponent and proponents, they will talk about censorship-resistant money. Okay, because everything is recorded, every transaction should be tracked in a digital system. That's for sure. Okay? Even in the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, everything is tracked, everything is recorded. But at the very least, it's designed in a way that you can't very easily censor the network. I'm not going to say it's impossible to censor the network because in the end, when you send out requests for transactions, there will always be a, there will always be a node okay, who gets to process that transactions for you. And if that node wants to censor you, okay, in practice, they can. But whether they want to is a different issue. Okay, so back to uh, academic work, Bitcoin white paper, 
cites eight papers. And some of the papers that they cite are about money. For example, the first citation, Wei Dai, okay, a programmer who was working on working on like cryptography as well, he was proposing B money. Okay, B money is um, a form of electronic money that acts like cash. Um, they all he cited um, Adam Back. Okay, Adam Back was uh, uh, the the paper is Adam Back wrote is hash cash. Again, that's another word, keyword built into it, cash. Okay, how do we create a digital cash using various cryptographic technologies? What I want to show you is that Bitcoin essentially builds on a previous collection of work, either on cryptography, okay, privacy, or electronic cash, and then propose a, net, uh, propose a new way of implementing a privacy-preserving money transfer network that acts a lot like cash and makes it very difficult to censor the system. And the key to, to that uh, resistant censorship is to decentralize the network and then record transactions as blockchain. So for most of us, when we see um, Bitcoin and we think about the blockchain, it's about how we record it. But the true genius behind that isn't just about the blockchain, it's about how we use the several pieces of jigsaw put together in a way that you create a self-referencing system that um, you know, creates an incentive for people to participate in a decentralized network. And the more decentralized the network is, um, the, more, the more assured you can be that your transactions won't be, won't be uh, censored. Okay, so it's like a you know, chicken egg thing. If transactions are uncensored, you wanna use a network. And if you wanna use a network, um, then that become like minus, for example, okay? Then your, your transactions uh, will become more difficult to be censored. Okay, so I'm gonna skip all these. You have a document, so I wanna show that, you know, there are some certain keywords in this paper, like 1991 paper written, um, to 1991? Yeah, 1991, okay. How to timestamp a digital document. So this was a research that came out of Bell Labs. Bell Labs is a lab that was affiliated with, you know, um, a whole group, at and okay. Bell, as in Alex, Alexander Graham Bell, the person who invented telephone. Okay, the big company became so big and um, they have like an R&D lab. And once the digital age hit, one of the questions that Bell Lab was working on was how to make sure that the documents in a digital database isn't tampered with. And that issue is very relevant today still. For example, Thai Post, okay, the postal system, national postal system of Thailand, they launched a electronic time stamping service earlier, I think last year or two years ago, because they want to make sure that when you, when you want to send out documents and so on, you can't come back and say that um, I send it on a different day. Okay. You know, there are certain processes that require exact timestamp, for example, applications of something or even uh, responding to court documents. We want to make sure that when you respond to that, you really respond within a timeline. If we, if you were working with the physical world, you would use the, the, the physical stamp, like the rubber stamp with the time and so on to make sure that this document was processed at this, exactly this time. But once we come to the digital world, how do we make sure that people don't just go back and then change the timestamp? So that was a problem that um, Stuart Harbour and Scott Sonetta wanted to solve. How do we make sure that the information inside the database isn't tampered with? They want to create a tamper detection system. And it turns out, everything that they, that they propose in here is exactly how the blockchain works, okay? But the block word blockchain didn't appear in that paper, but the data structure they propose is exactly the blockchain, okay? So here's how the blockchain works. It's a block of data. Yeah, you can put any block of data in that you want, but the chaining process is done to make sure that if you, if you wanna be certain that block one comes before block two and block two comes before block three, how do we know for sure that they come before one another? Okay, we make sure that the blocks are linked okay, to one another. So if I have block one, okay, the information in block one will be processed through what we call a cryptographic hash function. And this hash function essentially takes in whatever information that you want and it will spit out a digital signature of that information. Okay, so the content of block I put into the hash function and I get a digital fingerprint and I put this digital fingerprint into the next block. 
and the content of the next block is put into that function to create another fingerprint. So the fingerprint of the information in block two, which also contains the fingerprint of block one, okay, have been combined to generate the fingerprint of block two, which is put into block three. In other words, the fingerprint of the data is put into different blocks with dependency as a chain. And the magic of this cryptographic hash function is that if just one epsilon change of, in the data okay, is, is there, the fingerprint will no longer be the same. Okay, you, can, you can imagine like the games you play in your childhood, the photo hunt game, where you got to pick out you know, two pictures, which part of the picture is different. Okay. It's easy because it's made for games for us to see. But if you imagine changing the color of one pixel in that, far, in that, in that picture. Okay. To the human eye, you cannot see that the pixel has been changed you know, from, from dark blue to a, a lighter blue, but it's not exactly the same anymore. The cryptographic hash function will detect this change and will give out a different fingerprint. You actually don't know which pixel is wrong. Okay? The way the cryptographic hash function works is that it doesn't tell you exactly what is wrong where. It just tells you this block information put in, you get one fingerprint. A slightly modified block information put in a different fingerprint, they're not the same. I don't care which part has been tampered with, but I know for sure it's been tampered with because different input will create different outputs. So that's the blockchain. The, 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 the genius thing about the hash function is that you can do hash of hash of hash. What that means is that if I have, say, a block data of every transaction I want to put in, say I want to process 100 transactions, instead of putting all that transactions into the, into the, into the um, uh, input, I can put that information into a hash function first, and then only put in the fingerprint of that information into the green block where I create another fingerprint of that green block, like dependency, like levels, okay, of digital fingerprints you create. And that idea is actually called a Merkle tree. So here, um, Richard Merkle, protocols of public key encryptions. Okay, and he also actually proposed ideas like this, dependencies, okay, of uh, digital fingerprints. So long story short, we have a way to verify information being recorded as being tampered or not in a very, very efficient manner. You don't have to look through every single records anymore. All you need to know is show me the fingerprint of information in the, in the yellow block. If we have the same information, okay, the orange, the orange fingerprint will be the same. Now, for the next block, how do I know we have the right block number one? Show me the fingerprint of the information in the green block here. If the fingerprint that you have and I have match, we have the same data. So finally, how do we know we have the right history of data? All you need to know is to look at the latest fingerprint. If the latest fingerprint you have is the same as my latest fingerprint, we have exactly the same information being stored. Okay, so this we can coordinate across a decentralized network in a very, 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 very easy way. Some people might even call this like zero knowledge proof. Okay, I don't need to know what's inside, but I know what's being contained is exactly the same thing. Okay, so that's, that's the magic of cryptographic um, uh, mathematical functions that allow you to turn digital data in, into another digital data that is built for this purpose of tamper detection. This is a generic structure. I can put in any information that I want, okay? And I can also do this with just one single computing machine. But the Bitcoin network, uh, the blockchain of Bitcoin network is structured in a way that we have multiple nodes, okay? multiple data centers containing hopefully exactly the same information. But what if we don't contain exactly the same information? We have the built-in consensus mechanism to make sure that we agree on the states. Okay, we all keep the same. So I want to avoid a technical discussion, but these are the little pieces being put inside the white paper to make sure that even if we have a decentralized network, we agree on a state. Okay, so we do have third party, which is, I would say third parties, okay, everywhere around the world. We don't need to know who they are, but we know that we contain the same information because that's a very, very easy way to check. 
that information we contain is the same. There's also um, a mechanism inside to make sure that we agree on the state of the history. And we also will agree on what the next, the future state of the chain will become okay, via the mining process. Okay, so um, each block can also have a unique digital fingerprint. So they'll call this a block hash. So this will act like a receipt number. Okay, there are many, many uses of this you know, hash function. Because remember, it's meant to create a digital ID that is unique to some information. So the creative ways you can use it. In fact, you can even use this for non-blockchain non, um, uses as well. You know, your prompt pay slip. You can also use this to actually uh, generate a unique fingerprint of your prompt pay slip if you like. Okay, it's just a, an independent piece of technology that's being put inside this Bitcoin blockchain network. So you can see exactly okay what's being done. Somebody can tell you okay, okay the the um, hash of the of the block or even a hash or a transaction, and then you can verify for yourself what uh, what is the state being recorded on the blockchain. Okay, so we talked about Coinbase transactions already and so on. Going back to the problems we wanted to solve, how could we? Why is it that we can't send emails and um, have money go along with the email and be done? Because it turns out um, the message that represent uh, that that instructs the money transfer and the money being transferred are two different things. Okay, I can send. Um, I think the right word is Telegram. If I if I send a Telegram that I will pay you money, that message has been delivered, but the money also needs to be delivered independently of that message. Okay, when you transfer money from Bank A to Bank B. Bank A also has to transfer money to Bank B. Okay. In the past, when you were trying to, to transfer money across banks, the reason why you had to wait was because Bank A and Bank B had to deliver the money that you put in Bank A to Bank B, basically. So that was why when you want to transfer money across banks, it was easier for you to withdraw cash from one bank and put in cash at another bank because you were the one doing the money transportation. If you want banks to do it, they will do it, but they will do it in their own terms. So they may not do it every day. Okay? They may have some delays embedded in doing so. The reason why prompt pay works now, because banks have found a new way to deliver that money. And to give you a short answer to that, banks don't have to physically move money. Banks, bank A put money with the Bank of Thailand. Bank B also put money with the Bank of Thailand. So when you transfer money from bank A to bank B, uh, balance to be deducted at the Bank of Thailand from Bank A and put into Bank B. Okay? You just do this, this balance uh, transfer between two commercial banks that will represent money transfer. So this is why international remittance is slow because when you have money, I'm taking this example from IBM blockchain. Okay? So if Adam is in the United States and he banks with uh, you know, some bank, when he wants to transfer to uh, Laura, and Laura is in Brazil, I think, based on this geography. Okay, Laura also has her own bank. Um, Adam's bank needs to find ways to actually deliver the money to Laura's bank. It doesn't have to be physical delivery, okay, but it has to be a legal delivery of what we call money. So what the, the banking network does is that um, Adam's bank will have to find um, through the banking network of who in this banking network have this cross-holding of bank balances, okay? We call this technically the Bostro Nostro account, but don't worry about the details. But the idea is that Adam's bank has a balance with bank A, and bank A also has a balance at Adam's bank. So when, Adam want, uh, when, when Adam's bank needs to settle with bank A, they would adjust the balance across the two banks, okay? If Adam's bank has a direct relationship with Laura's bank, easy. They can adjust the balance directly, okay? Because they're counterparties. But if Adam's bank doesn't really know Laura's bank, then they have to go through a daisy chain of this bank balance adjustment throughout the banking network to make sure that money is legally delivered to Laura's bank before Laura's bank clears the funds for disbursement. Okay, so that's how the international remittance works. And the system that allows you to communicate, like sending SMS, is called SWIFT. Okay, so it's like Society of Wireless International something something fund transfer. Okay. 
uh, Americans have a very creative way of creating the acronyms. Okay, they try to put acronyms into something that um that um is easy to remember. Okay, so like you know, um after COVID hit, they wanted to uh, kickstart American economy. So I think they created like an act that uh, abbreviated as a jobs or something like that. I'm not. I don't recall correctly whether it's COVID or subprime crisis, but you know they created an act, a legal act that tries to kickstart the economy and abbreviates as J-O-B-S, jobs. In any, in any case, okay, that's how the SWIFT messaging system and also money delivery works. So how does blockchain solve this? If Adam's banks and Laura's banks are connected on the blockchain, all we have to do is um, tell, tell Adam, tell, bank, tell the bank that I want to transfer money to Laura. So Adam's bank and Laura's bank who are connected via this blockchain, they will just settle their balance and then Laura's bank can then make the disbursement. To take this one step further, we actually don't need Adam's bank or Laura's bank. Okay? If Adam and Laura opens an um, account, so to speak, okay, on some open blockchain network, like Bitcoin blockchain or Ethereum blockchain, Adam can transact with Laura directly okay, without requiring banks. So that is why you would hear narratives like um, um, you unbank yourselves. Okay. You don't need to use banks to transfer money anymore. To transfer money as long as you accept um, numbers on the blockchain, like Bitcoin, for example, as money, I can transfer Bitcoin to you directly without requiring intermediaries like Adam's Bank, Bank A, Bank B, and Laura's Bank. Because you and I are on, are on the same database. If you and I are on the same database, database already, it's as easy as adjusting the balances on the database. One, one of the challenges of international financial system is that we are not on the same database. Okay. Even in Thailand, okay, if you have bank-based money, bank, if you have bank balance, 100 baht in one bank is actually not the same as 100 baht in another bank. Okay. But we have mechanisms to make sure that they're transferable between the two. But it's in, technically, it's in a different data environment. Okay. And even legally, the deposit you have in bank A is bank A's debt to you. Okay, you're bank A's creditor. The moment you transfer money to bank B, you now become bank B's creditor. Okay, so that's a challenge in the modern financial system. But whereas if you have money in a blockchain, say Bitcoin, okay, there's no Bitcoin issuer. If you have that money, it's like you're in possession of some other forms of money. This could be like gold. Right? gold coins. Nobody issues gold coin. You can have stamps on gold coins, like um, uh, a city mayor or the king of that country, stamping the face of the kings, the queens, and values, so on. But for in the age where we use gold coins, what really mattered wasn't the stamp. What really mattered was, is this gold coin real? And what is the volume of this coin? That's what really mattered. The stamping, which is for convenience, the, the value actually resided in gold itself. So if you use this logic, um, if you have numbers on the blockchain and you know that numbers isn't fake, okay, that numbers has been authenticated, nobody can actually um, you know, put in more money into that balance without the system's mission, then you can accept that numbers as money. It can also be money just like gold coin. Okay, so blockchain in, in essence solves international transfers or payments problem by using a single common database. If everyone is in the same database and if we accept what is in, in that database as money, then transfer is very, very easy. And you can imagine the challenges, right? Um, you know, just sending messages in a network that doesn't really reflect money, uh, society had a problem with already. As you can imagine going to web boards that doesn't ask you to identify who you are, you can post whatever you want, there are no rules. Things can get, very scary quickly, okay? And this is about money. So there's always a tension. On the one end, um, if you put on a government's hat, they definitely don't like the system, okay? Because um, there's, there's not a lot of purview of what they can do. Okay? But on the other side, if you are putting on the hats of the cypherpunk and you believe that uh, government equals oppression, then you would like the system because this system is designed to make sure that um, those kinds of oppression, whether it's from government or corporate, can be um, defended against. Okay? I wouldn't say eliminated, okay? because the networks can actually be taken over by someone. 
but as long as it's sufficiently decentralized, you can be a little bit more, um, a little bit more pacified that your actions will not be easily censored. Okay. So back to Laszlo Hanyek again, you can actually look on the Bitcoin network to show that yes, okay, 10,000 Bitcoins was transferred. In fact, 10,000 Bitcoins plus 0.99 Bitcoins transferred because that's actually a transaction fee associated with using this network as well. So he paid 0.99 Bitcoin as a transaction fee to make sure that his request to transfer gets processed by the network. So that was actually a net cost of this Bitcoin pizzas, not 10,000, but 10,099, 0.99 units of Bitcoin. You can have a look there to see for yourself that this transaction indeed happened. So this is also a bit like, okay, a bit like you know, your prompt pay slip. You can scan and see that this transaction being processed. But you know, if you broadcast this to the whole world, then they will know. It's just like your prompt pay slip. If you post your prompt pay slip to the whole world without censoring your names, then they will also know that this is your, uh, this is trans transaction belongs to you. Okay, so this is what we mean by pseudo pseudonymity. Okay, it's not anonymous. It's anonymous as long as you don't tell who you are or as long as other people don't find out who you are. Because if they find out who you are, even you are unwilling about it, there's nothing you can do about it. Because what is recorded on the system is always going to be forever recorded on there. You can't go back and make any changes. Okay. So some early Bitcoin finance research was like this paper in 2013 by Professor David Yermak. Okay, So he wrote a very short paper Okay, on is Bitcoin a real currency? Putting on the hats of economists, we have a view of what a currency or money should look like. So these would be things like, you know, does it preserve the value or not? If I spend 10,000 units of uh, Bitcoin for pizza today, will I regret this? Like, you know, does it have to be three years down the road? Okay, like, um, you know, one year down the road, did I, did I overspend? Should I, have chosen, should I have chosen a different currency instead? Okay, so I'm not asking about, should I have bought the pizzas? I'm asking about, should I have spent a different currency to buy that pizza? Then obviously with this, you might be, you know, if we're not very strong will, we might be a little bit uh, disappointed with our decision. You know, but last little hand, yeah, he gave interviews. Obviously, okay, the whole world is going to ask him, how do you feel? How do you feel about spending that? Okay? And he said, at that point in time, that transaction, I think that was a deal that was good, was worth it. And that's the very... Courageous of him to admit that, right? You can't go back and change history. So why not? You know, you, why feel regretful about it? Just live on and then move on instead. But that's the point about currency. Okay, a currency is a system of money that is used to measure value of transactions. So if you want to spend in some currency, you know, there are properties of that currency that you want. Okay. You can also imagine on the flip side, if you go into countries like Venezuela, for example, right? Where countries where we have extreme ex hyperinflation, uh, you really want to spend money today because if you don't spend money today, in fact, if you don't spend money in this 15 minutes, the next 15 minutes, the price may be different. Okay. In some countries, there have been cases like that, right? The price changes in real time. So the later you spend your money, uh, the, the more regretful you're going to become. That money could have bought a bit more coffee. You spend it like, two days earlier, okay? So that's why we need a bit of stability in currency. So papers like this would say, these, these uh, new cryptocurrencies, whether it's Bitcoin or whether it's other networks being created, they don't really look a lot like currency that, that works well in society. We can call them currency, but functionally, there's little evidence that people use this as currency because if it's a currency, people will spend it. Right. People use it to measure value, people spend it, but it's difficult to do so given the historical evidence so far. Okay, so you can read more about this. Okay. It needs to be more stable so it can be used as a store of value and so on and so on. Okay. Store of value isn't, about, isn't just about going down, it's about not going up too quickly too. It needs to have some sort of stability. So look even further, that's why a lot of central banks around the world have monetary policy to make sure they have price abilities. Price stability in many dimensions. Price stability in terms of inflation, price stability in terms of um, exchange rate across uh, many currencies in the world, and even price stability in terms of interest rate. Because when you borrow money from the future, interest rate is a price of future money. Okay, so three dimensions. Money versus goods and services inflation. Okay, your money versus other system of money, that's exchange rate. 
and money today versus money in the future, interest rate. So these are three policy trade-offs that if you are in charge of um, looking after a country's currency system, you might want to worry about. But Bitcoin, on the other hand, there's nobody in charge, so there's nobody look, looks after. I remember in 2000 and I think 2018, uh, one of the high school students in the national schools came to interview me about this, like, you know, would Bitcoin be a good uh, currency? So from currency perspective, my view is very similar to Professor Yermak in the sense that you're not going to use Bitcoin to spend. You're not going to use Bitcoin to measure value because that is no monetary authority that tries to make sure of that stability. But whether Bitcoin is a good speculative asset or not, well, let me tell you, I wish I can go back in time. Yeah. And tell, tell um, that student and also tell myself, buy Bitcoin. <laughs> okay? So again, I want to I wanna point out that we're putting on an economist hat and thinking in terms of currency. Because if you call something a currency, there are properties of currencies that people expect. And good currencies are, current, uh, are units that people want to transact on, both for today, for international trades, and for intertemporal trade. Okay? Intertemporal means across time, so today and tomorrow. Okay? And then this became um, a chapter in the Handbook for Digital Currency. Professor David Yermak um, turned, that, uh, turned that little working paper into a chapter. And you can have a look at the number of citations, like 2,000 citations, because they were built based on that earlier papers. And it wasn't until 2024 that this became a book. But this paper, this uh, working paper, actually came out in 2014, 10 years on. 10 years earlier, talking about Bitcoin is still a little bit like a taboo. Okay, in, um, in the world of uh, economists. Later on, there are papers uh, like this, okay, in 2016, that, that look at the time series properties of Bitcoin prices. So from your econometrics class, we have like, you know, tools of a time series detection. Is this series explosive? Is this like autoregressive, blah, blah, and so on. So we can use it to look at the efficiency. There are very various forms of detecting the efficiency of uh, price efficiency of something, okay? So again, this was one of the earlier papers published in Economics Letters, um, short, crisp, but widely overlooked by top economists. Okay? So when it came out, top economists didn't really pay attention to that. But you know, um, eight years on, 1,500 citations, because it is the first paper okay, that looked at the time series properties of Bitcoin in a more serious manner. Then we also started seeing okay, a different group okay, of research, um, a, a research journal. This one is called Finance Research Letters. Again, a letter, a letter format in, in academia means you write something very short, very brief, one single idea, and then only build around that. So these articles have like word limits. Uh, you can send uh, only up to like 2,000 words. Longer than that, they say too long, rejected. Okay? So they write things like gosh, volatility model. Yeah, the earlier one was like price properties. This one is like volatility properties. A very common time series tools that can be applied to price series. Because after all, about 2016 is a time where a data service aggregators start releasing a time series of Bitcoin prices across different markets. So now you have data to work with academics, right? About the properties of those time series. So that was about Bitcoin, okay? In, in around 2016, a young programmer, Vitalik, um, he, he, he wanted to, he, he recognized the idea of decentralization, but he also recognized the limits of Bitcoin network that it doesn't really allow to do anything other than uh, mine it, okay, or transfer it. If it's, a, if it's a spreadsheet, this spreadsheet doesn't allow you to create new information or new logic at all. It is a very specific type of database that only created to solve the payment problem. Remember, it's an e-cash paper. So they're only interested in payments and transfers. But financial services are wider than that. So Vitalik thought, hey, what if we allow this decentralization to be more than just decentralization of transfer decisions, but decentralization of any programming logic? What if we have a, compute, a computer network that, um, that is everywhere around the world that people can send instructions for computations to, and those instructions for computations can be very wide. We can do a lot more things, okay? So that was the inception of the Ethereum network. 
The DevCon that was held this week in Thailand is the conference for developers of the Ethereum blockchain mainly, but you know, other blockchains now also join uh, the, the, the um, discussions as well. So that was a white paper. Actually, it came out in 2014. The network didn't really take off until about 2016 or so, if I recall correctly. Okay? So you can actually read this online yourself. He outlines all the wonders of decentralization and also his um, frustration with the limitation of the Bitcoin network and the problems he wanted to solve um, along with his co-founders of the Ethereum um, blockchain. So this became the birth of what we call the programmable blockchain. Because the Bitcoin network originally did not allow you to program anything at all. In fact, it wasn't even, even a program. It was not like a script you can write on there. You can write a more full-fledged program on blockchains like Ethereum. So you can write almost any programming logic in there. And the technical name for this, people refer to as smart contracts. But technically speaking, smart contracts means a unit on the information network that becomes like a bot. Okay? You can send instructions to and it will do exactly what you instructed to do. Previously, when you um, open, say, accounts, they use the word address okay, on blockchain network, you use it to just hold assets and then transfer. So let me go back a little bit to, to um, Laszlo Hanyek. Um, you would also see his address on the blockchain network. And that will be where he holds his funds. And they can send instructions to transfer funds to other addresses. And the reason we call them addresses, not accounts, is because an account typically associates with your name. Okay? Address is like a destination, like a postal order box, a PO box. You don't need to know who owns that PO box. Just tell me where to send it, and then I'll send it there. Okay? So that's a layer of uh, privacy being, um, being reflected in the choice of uh, language they use. So in a programming, programmable blockchain like Ethereum, in addition to just um, create new addresses that you can own yourself, you can also use those addresses to contain programming logics so that people can transact, instruct, and then they'll do the calculations you want. So you can read about how the blockchain works um, on you know, uh, resources like this. This is a little bit, um, the network has evolved a little bit since the, the time of these writing, but the gist of the idea is the same, okay? What's evolved is more about um, how, census, how consensus mechanism works, how incentive structure works. But the idea of a programmable blockchain is still the same. Okay? You send instructions, um, you send the resources required to do the, do the computations, and then you also send like, you know, transaction fees, like tips and so on to incentivize people to do it for you. And then um, if a node wins and then they see your request and then they're interested in your request, they'll process that request for you. Okay? Broadly speaking like that. So here's an example, okay? USDT is uh, short for US dollar by Tether, okay? It's, it's, it belongs to a class of, um, now I'm gonna use the word digital asset, okay? Uh, information being created on programmable blockchain that is meant to represent currencies. So we call these stable coins, okay? They're units created to have um, a stable exchange rate versus some reference asset. So what do we have here? Um, in this address, okay, that is represented by the 42 um, characters and digits, okay, zero X something something, this will be an address. And the blockchain, it says it's a contract because this address actually contains programming codes. And this address will contain the programming codes for the Tether USDT stablecoin. Once you look inside the blockchain further, you would see that uh, the codes written allows you to transfer information between address to address. And that code also creates the units of numbers, which we call the Tether USDT as well. Let me take you to the next page. That is the programming part. So the codes that allow you to read information on blockchain. So these codes, some examples would be codes that uh, tell you how many units of this information is recorded on a blockchain at that moment. So this is a little bit outdated because I wrote this um, some, some time ago, but the addresses are the same. Once you click on the link, you can go inside and see the current state of these addresses. Okay. You can tell because you know the exchange rate for one ether was um, 1700, but right now it's more like 3000. So 
on the left hand side there's a read contract on the right hand side is a write contract that means that these are the codes that you can use you can call to write changes to the state of the blockchain network so these states could be something like i want to transfer okay i want to, I want to um, add some addresses to the blacklist so you can actually create these programming logics if you like okay so when we said earlier that the network is meant to produce a censorship resistant network i mean the whole network level okay when you want to send instructions in principle okay anyone can pick up the instructions from you and then process but if the programmer behind this service adds another layer that i want to bar say ajan kanit from doing transaction i know ajan kanit controls 10 addresses so i put in these 10 addresses in the blacklist i can send the instruction and my instruction will always fail because i am on the blacklist okay what this reflects is that if you're a programmer you can write any logic that you want uh, the bitcoin network is a program okay and a programmer explicitly states that you don't need to help other people who you are okay and there is no function that blacklist any address there's like no explicit function that this address coming from ajan kanit or whoever that's on the list will be forever banned from the network okay that doesn't exist but on the flip side if you talk about smart contracts these are programs being written on networks again so if the programmer wants to censor someone or want to create any rules they can okay because a program is a human construct both the bitcoin network was a program by human construct that didn't build in any censorship feature but if this is a sub program within a larger program you can always write a program that censor you can always write any rules that you want because programs are determined by the programmers behind them and that is the you know the nature of these computer network so these are examples of course being written so the programming language is called solidity so these are like you know um, equivalent to say python or r and so on you can send instructions and the computer know how to read this instruction how to process so solidity here's an example of a of a transfer function if you um call a transfer function you need to specify who do i want to transfer to okay and then also the amount of information i want to transfer to and then this is going to go and check oh make sure that the message sender isn't blacklisted Okay, and if you're not blacklisted, congratulations. Your request may be processed, or no, will be processed. Sorry. Okay, if you meet the conditions of the network, but if you are on the blacklist, sorry, your request will be denied. What I just showed you was um, rules created from programmers. that want to create information called usdt and they have mechanisms to make sure that what usdt represents so stable coin is meant to represent some currency so they will say oh to make sure that people have faith that one unit can represent one dollar i am going to hold a dollar equivalent assets outside the blockchain okay to make sure that for every unit of a uh, stable coin dollar equivalent there's a dollar asset somewhere that is backing it but you know you can actually create new information without promising anything quite easily because that information is as easy as writing numbers into an excel spreadsheet okay so around 2017 2019 a lot of people started realizing this that wait a minute i can write information in spreadsheets and then i can transfer that money to other people i can use this to sell the information the numbers being created and once you sell numbers on a very very um um loose interpretation when you buy shares you most of you just get numbers right because you know you all, all you worry about is in the uh, application that you use for trading does the number show the units of shares you own properly if it does then you own the shares and that's all you worry about i paid money and i get the numbers representing shares but the reason why you are happy with receiving those shares is because yeah. these shares are legal documents that outlines the rights and responsibilities that the issuer like the company has with you okay so they're legally required to do something for you but um in 2017 2018 people you know kind of mimic those kind of promise by a a white paper okay white paper essentially 
literally means in Thai literally translates into um, a book that has white cover. Okay, but white paper means it's a document that's just meant for discussion. It's not meant to promise anything. Okay, just like the Bitcoin network, they wrote the right paper, just floating out ideas. They're not making any commitment to anyone. So people started issuing these coins, these numbers, and then have white paper documents associated with them. Once I get the money from you, I will do this, I will do that, I will do those, and so on. But that's actually no legal, you know, that's no legal obligation to do anything for anyone. So for some saw this as an easy way, okay, to raise money and then go and build something they're interested in. And for others, more nefarious, more malicious use, they see this as a way to just scam people with money. Okay. So there was a boom in fundraising. And they call it initial coin offering fundraising. But I want to get a little bit technical here. Bitcoin, we call this coin because it comes with a Bitcoin network. Okay. Ethereum also has a coin called Ether. It comes with an Ethereum network. But USDT that you saw earlier is actually not a coin. It's called a digital token. A token, technically speaking, is something you create inside a Bitcoin network, uh, sorry, inside a blockchain network again. So within Ethereum network, there's, there's an Ether coin that is necessary for the operation of the Ethereum network. Okay? But within the Ethereum network, you can create any numbers that you want. And if your number is a second type, like a number within a spreadsheet, that's called a token, okay? And the reason people distinguish this because creating a coin means creating a whole new network. It means asking people to come and run software on the computers, be part of this decentralized system, and then giving out these coins in exchange as participation. Like Dogecoin, for example, is a whole new network. Dogecoin is a, a replica of the Bitcoin network with a few parameters being changed. For example, Bitcoin network will reduce the reward okay, um, every four years or so. A Dogecoin is created so that there's no limit. Okay? You can, now as time goes on, there'll be more and more and more and more coins. Okay? But the software is just like Bitcoin network but with a few parameters being changed. So when you have like that, you need to have someone running the Dogecoin network software somewhere to secure that network. But if you create like USDT, for example, all you need is that you have someone running Ethereum software. And if you have a, a network of people running Ethereum software, now you can piggyback on that network and create new tokens like USDT just by writing codes like these codes. Okay. And to make the process even more simplified, I can have uh, ready-made codes that people can just copy and paste and then have the coins that they like. And this is what ERC20 means. ERC, ERC stands for Ethereum Request for Comments. These are like uh, in, in programming, in programming community, it's uh, open source programming community. It's like a call for ideas. I want to improve this um, software. Can you let me know how to improve this software? And there are many, many um, requests for comments, but one of the, this request for comments specifically is a request for comment on if you want to create a standardized set of codes that allow creation of new tokens like this, what should be the standardized codes that we write so that people can just easily copy and paste those codes and then use. So for those of you who use Python and R, this is basically a library, okay, that you can just call rather than write their codes from the raw uh, command yourself. So with this ERC20 standards, you can just copy and paste the code and create any tokens that you like. So there was a boom in the amount and number of coins being sold. So much so that in 2018, the amount of money being put into this ecosystem is more than actual startup funding, venture capital funding. Okay. But then they slow down. Why? Because people started realizing, wait a minute, if you sell coins and then promise something, that's like selling a security. The security, broadly speaking, is a contract. Okay? It's a contract between two parties that have some promises and obligations. So in many countries around the world, offering securities require approvals. This comes back to the early days, like in the 1920s or so on, 
offering securities was uh, lightly regulated and there were lots of scams in the US stock markets. And that led to 19, uh, 1929 um, stock market crash. So in 1930s or so on, the U United States government came out with a sweeping set of regulations on how to create banks, regulate uh, um, exchanges, how to regulate um, investment companies, uh, securities offerings, even investment professionals. Okay, so that was the key event in history around 1920s, 1930s or so, about 100 years ago, that led to this modern regulation. Okay. I'll just do a little bit more and then we'll take a break. And around that point in time, more serious professors start coming in. Okay, Ji Guo He is uh, one of the top Chinese professors at, at, um, at Chicago Booth. Okay, um, probably one of the top five Chinese professors in the world recognized in the um, in finance community. He started writing on, on like blockchain and smart contract. Okay, with Professor uh, uh, Hong Lin. At, oh, so he moved. Okay, so he was at Cornell. I know maybe he was a, he was still at Booth back then, but now he's at Cornell. Okay. They started writing about the potential for this to, to change the world. By the way, this came from, I think, Review of Financial Studies, okay? One of the top three academic journals in finance field. So we saw in 2016, um, researchers were writing in more minor journals, but this submission was received in 2017. So back then, serious academics started noticing already. By the way, Professor David Yermak is actually a big name. Okay, he's a big name, not in crypto back then, he was a big name in corporate governance. He, he's a, you know, if you, you read a, a pa papers on corporate governance and, and you know, uh, there were fascinating papers about if companies have private jets, do they have weak or good corporate governance? He was, a, he was the author of that paper. Okay, and then he started looking more into this blockchain things. There are also papers written about the ICO, okay, some from legal perspective, left-hand side, the legal papers, the ICO gold rush. It's a scam, it's a bubble, it's a ch challenge for regulators. Again, review of financial studies. Now David Yermak, Professor David Yermak is publishing, okay, if review of financial studies on the initial coin offering. And they start looking at the, the um, precisely from this graph, right? A lot of initial coins offerings are happening. So how were they... You know, how did it play out? What were the determinants of success and failures and so on? Uh, management science is also another widely recognized journal, but has a, a broader base of, a, of a content in there. So they also have you know, papers like this, initial coins offering success and post ICO performance. For those of you who are still looking for topics, um, who were interested in say IPOs, you may have seen very similar, top, uh, similar titles in research that uh, use um, initial public offering instead of initial coin offering. Okay. What I want to get across is that by then more serious finance professors started taking notice and then they, they bring, the, they bring the, um, the usual traditional finance questions and try to look at what happened in the world of um, decentralized finance using a very similar uh, lens and, um, and framework. Here, yeah, Professor David Yermak also starts writing about corporate governance. Okay. So, you know, we have access to all these papers at our university. You can have a look at that if you're interested in. So he also talked about, you know, um, how the blocks are being created in a more um, easy to understand way, I guess. Okay. And the reason why we, we start talking about corporate governance is because, you know, in a way, um, blockchain fosters transparency. You hear a lot of these narratives. Okay, once you have this blockchain, we have transparency. Okay. And another is because blockchain also allows voting. One of the big narratives that uh, were happening around that point in time is, should we go with blockchain-based voting? Because if you think about what a vote is, a vote is basically, um, you know, you transfer your right to some name. Okay. But you do this physically by ticking a box at a voting ballot. What if you are given a token, okay, a digital token, one person, one digital token, and you get to choose who to transfer your token to. Well, that's voting, isn't it? You're already voting in effect by just transferring this token some blockchain. In fact, um, there have been people that compare the equity market, the capital market, as like you know, shareholder, um, shareholder democracy, right? In a sense that you vote with your money instead of one man, one vote, one share, one vote. And then, you know, if you like, you would buy. If you like, you would transfer. 
some blockchain-based systems have been used um, precisely because of this immutability. If you decide to vote, nobody can go back and change your vote. Okay, if you have like remote voting ballots and so on, people worry, wait a minute, do I, how do I know the ballot box that hasn't been switched and so on and so on. Okay. And we also started getting papers about um, how this decentralization um, is um, affecting, okay, affecting the way we think about money. This is one, this one is by um, Emiliano Pagnotta, who's at UI, uh, Imperial College, and he's also affiliated with SMU. Uh, by now, um, Kong Lin is at uh, Cornell. He was at Chicago before, now he's at Cornell. And um, he started writing about extensions of that papers, okay, about if we think about the properties of tokens on blockchain and what they represent in terms of um, rights that you get and also fundraising, how would it look compared to traditional equity fundraising if we issue these coins instead? Again, being published in Review of Financial Studies. On the flip side, the Journal of Finance also published paper, but it turns out the, um, the Journal of Finance papers tend to be more on asset pricing, which I find surprising because if you look at, say, asset pricing papers, factor investing papers, you tend to see more of that in uh, IFS compared to Journal of Finance. But here we have a group of researchers who look at common risk factors in cryptocurrency. So this is essentially like a farmer French model, but can we create a different uh, proxy for the risk factors and run the farmer French like model for cryptocurrencies instead. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the evolution. There's also a, a group of researchers who get access to trading data and then they try to think about the transaction being uh, seen in these exchanges because back then these exchanges weren't regulated yet. So one of the issues you might be interested in as um, a user is if this exchange, they say they're number one, in terms of trading volume, is that trading volume real? I mean, if there's no regulator, you don't know whether they fake their own trading volume or not. So that's called wash trading, right? I buy and sell within myself to make the impression that that's a lot of activity, even though there's really nothing. So again, uh, Kong Lin um, has access to that. And then this paper actually took a long time. He wrote this paper, I think in 2017, and it took him four years, five years okay, to get this published. So it's a con very controversial idea still in the uh, academic circles. Okay, so I think this is a good time to take a break. After break, we'll come back and talk about decentralized finance. So up, up to the break, we're still in the mode of like, you know, um, decentralized money, how to, how to move value across different states, uh, sorry, different, different place, okay, um, via an alternative internet, so to speak, right? So you can actually send values to another address directly without requiring you to do a jump between different daily, daily chains because we're in a unified system. Once we're all connected, we can think about other services we might want to, we might want to have if you want to have a more complete financial services. So let's talk briefly about what financial system uh, and banks actually do. Okay? Since this is a more technical class, I want to organize this idea into something that an economist okay, might speak uh, about uh, in, in the same uh, terminology. So contemporaneous means now, right? In, in the present. So you can connect people contemporaneously, like what you have, what you own. I want to send the value I have to you immediately. I want to exchange what I have to what you have immediately in the present. So there's, um, once you translate that into financial services, there's a couple of things okay, that stand out. The first one is I have assets, but I want to have these assets in a digital form. Can you make sure that my digital forms of assets are actually real and exist? So it turns out for certain assets that you have that are crossed between both worlds, like your stock certificates, for example, there's a lot of, a, there's a lot of a professionals in, in the industry behind the scene that make sure that the stocks that you own in digital form is actually valid and real, okay? So companies like Thailand Securities Depositories uh, are helping you, um, keeping check of your digital ownership of stocks and also helping companies to, to close their books to find out if they need to pay dividends, who do, you, who do they pay to? And if they need to invite you to, to cast a vote on some motions, they know exactly who has the right to vote. But if your asset is represented as digital information directly on the blockchain, 
the thing is, if you have information on the blockchain, it's always self-reconciling. You saw earlier for USDT, the stable coin, you can know at any point in time, in every single blocks, how many units of that tokens exist. You can also find out who are holding those um, digital tokens as well, as long as they hold it natively on the blockchain via their addresses. So this allows you to actually take ownership of your digital assets without requiring intermediary, without requiring um, uh, financial services providers like um, custodians, for example. So when you hold digital assets like Bitcoin and so on directly on the blockchain in your address, okay, that is controlled by what we call a private key. So that acts a bit like, I don't want to say password because password can be reset, but a key to a door is unique. Okay, A key and a lock is unique. If you want to change uh, the key, it's impossible without changing the lock. Okay. That key to your address is unique, and if you hold on to it, you have access to it. You can control it. You can send instructions from it. And if your assets are held inside the address that's secured by your private key, you don't need any custodians to hold those assets for you. So sometimes these addresses, which can be organized in a software called a wallet that helps you organize multiple addresses, by the way, okay? um, we call this a non-custodial wallet. That means you don't need um, a custodian custodian to help you hold it, like a Thailand security depository, for example. Okay? Sometimes you also call this uh, a self-hosted wallet. Okay? We host it ourselves. Nobody hosts this wallet for us. Okay? So non-custodial wallet, self-hosted wallet. Sometimes people call this a self-custody. Okay? We hold this ourselves. So when you talk, when you talk to, um, you know, um, um, Bitcoin um, opponents, official analysts, they will say like you can you can be your own bank precisely because of this reason, right? You don't need to have banks or hold your financial wealth for you. You hold your financial wealth directly in your address on the blockchain, as long as society accepts those those um, digital assets as representation of wealth that you can transfer it, you can spend it, you can um, do whatever you want with it. Then um, you don't need financial system to hold that for you. That self custodial. Um, asset custody safekeeping. You can also think about payments and exchanges. And this is where Bitcoin comes into a bit of a challenge because on a Bitcoin blockchain, that's nothing but Bitcoin. So when you, when you spend money to buy, say, pizza, for example, um, the spending part on chain, nobody knows you're actually spending it. All you know is you're transferring. Okay, You're transferring Bitcoin to someone, but whether you transfer that because you just want to, okay, you try, or you transfer that in exchange for something, the system doesn't know. Okay, but what if you have an ecosystem like Ethereum blockchain that allows you to have a lot of assets being represented as digital tokens as well? I can transfer, say, a USDT stable coin in exchange for other tokens that I like, and I can do that exchange directly on the blockchain without requiring an intermediary like um, you know, an exchange, for example. So that's the second function, payment and exchange. Okay? I can pay for goods and services on chain that I want, Okay, and exchange one digital asset for another digital asset on chain if I want as well. If I can write a financial logic into a programming code, I can do that automatically. That's a contemporaneous. You're moving, you're moving um, uh, say, financial representation across forms, money to stock, stock to bonds, for example, and across space from Thailand to, to United States. And that's an easy problem because all you worry about is do the assets exist? If they exist, we just swap. Okay, that's done. Or does the destination exist? If it exists, I transfer my digital assets to that address. It's done. The challenging part is connecting intertemporally. Okay, intertemporal means across different points in time. That means I want money to use today, but I'll pay back tomorrow. Can I do it? You can but it's more challenging. Okay? In traditional finance, fundraising is essentially this. I want to start a business. I want to get funds to open a new coffee shop. Can you give me support? You may not be willing to give me that support because you might not trust me. Or you might trust me, but you don't think a coffee shop is a good idea because after all, 18 10 coffee shops fail. I don't want to back another coffee shop. So there's several reasons why someone might not want to back you. Okay, That's fundraising. Saving and investment sometimes is used interchangeably. So my understanding is that when you save, you are thinking about wealth protection. Okay, when you invest, you're thinking about growing your wealth. 
So it's the same thing, or different spec perspective, uh, a different part of the spectrum of the risk return trade off. But saving and investment is the other side of fundraising because, after all, if you save and you invest, where does money come from? There are two ways money comes from. Okay, first one is someone um, does a business and share the benefits of that business with you as debt, which they have to, which they have to give you back because they really owe you, or as equity. And equity means equal, right? Equal in a sense that one share, one right, the same right. So you have the same type of ownership as a founder, but maybe the founder has more shares than you. But for each share that we own, we have exactly the same right. That's why we call it equity. Okay? And wealth management is essentially you know, an easy way for you to think about saving investment and hire someone to do it on your behalf instead. I didn't talk about another way of getting money. The first way of getting money is somebody makes something and then they pay you. Another way of making money is I buy low and sell high. Okay? So even if an asset doesn't generate any cash flow, as long as I buy low and sell high, that's fine. So you, if you um, um, follow some investors like Warren Buffett, um, Warren Buffett never buys gold because uh, he thinks the only way to make money from gold is to sell it for a higher price. Whereas when he buys some companies, BYD, Apple, and so on, he buys because he wants the cash flows that those businesses generate. Okay, that's a, actually an investment from a fundraising perspective that um, your investment asset actually generates direct cash flow yield from real economy. Whereas the other type of investment is more like a transfer from the, from the buyer. Okay? Somebody buys it off you, so you get the money. And that, and that even if an asset doesn't generate any direct benefit, you can do so. Okay? So that's a fine line between investment versus speculation in that sense. Okay? Finally, risk management is an intertemporal transfer but across very specific states. I want to transfer money today where I have financial resources in the form of insurance premium and transfer it precisely to the state of the world where an accident happens. If you think about a saving, it's an intertemporal transfer, but a blanket transfer. I have money today. I want to transfer money to the future, whatever happens. Okay? In any state of the world, I want to get my money back. So that's a bit like, you know, I don't want to take any risk across the uncertainty that can happen. So I want a very safe transfer from today to the future. But if you want to invest, you're investing by accepting that in some states of the world, for example, the company does well, it pays me a lot of dividends. I'm great. If the company goes bankrupt, I lose all my money. Not great, not great news, but I'm willing to take that odds. So uh, risk management is uh, even more specific, right? I transfer my money uh, today, but only to very specific states of the world, like accidents happening, oil price rising, interest rate uh, uh, dropping. So insurance contract, derivatives contract, that can be used to transfer across time and states of the world. That's what we mean by intertemporal. That's the hard part, because people don't like uncertainty. Okay, and people can't really specify the states of the world. And even if we can specify the states of the world, we don't know whether the, the other, the counterparty, is going to honor the obligation or not. Whereas a, a contemporaneous exchange is easy because um, you have, you know, in Thai, there's a saying, right? You have, uh, um, you, you have chicken, I have uh, pigs. So we can see you have the chickens, I have the pigs. So, okay, let's walk. Or like in... in um, you know, if, you, if you watch like Romance Three Kingdoms, Sam Gok, right? You do like prisoner exchange. So you would have to make sure, okay, both side prisoners are okay. So start walking. You want to make sure that you get what you want. And it's easy to verify because you can see, you can feel, you can verify. But if you do it across the states of the world, that's a bit difficult, okay? Because um, one, it's uncertain. And two, you don't know whether the counterparty can actually deliver on that promise or not. Because after all, we're talking about chicken in the future, which doesn't exist yet. Okay, so there are mechanisms that you that you you want to put in place to make sure that if you're on the side of giving money, you can make sure that you can get money back. Okay. Okay. So that's the background of how financial system works. Now let me put the, you back into the in the timeline. Now we're gonna go back to 2021 when I kind of start uh, looking into this DeFi because I'm. I got into this space not because I was interested in blockchain from the Bitcoin perspective, I'm more interested in the DeFi perspective where I can write these smart contract logics to intermediate all these financial services. 
The gentleman you see in the picture is Rune Christensen, okay? And Rune Christensen, uh, according to his story, uh, he is a digital nomad, okay? He works everywhere around the world as a programmer. So he, he, once he gets paid, um, um, you know, in say US dollars or so, he can live and work, uh, write codes anywhere he pleases. So if I recall correctly, he has a, a coworker, maybe his team, um, he, they work in Argentina. The challenge in Argentina is that the, at the state of the Argentinian economy wasn't so good. If you have international remittance, it's high, difficult, it's slow, and more importantly, when you transfer dollars into Argentina, the exchange rate between dollars, US dollars and Argentinian peso depends on where you exchange the dollars. Okay? If you exchange the dollars via the banking system, it's one rate. If you exchange in the black market, is another rate. Okay? That was, that's what happens when, say, com when countries have like, uh, exchange controls. In Thailand, for example, when, when um, our peg with US dollars was about to break down, even though $1 is 25 baht, you go outside the market, they don't sell you dollars or 25 baht. You go outside Thailand, they sell you for like 30, 40 baht. Okay, because they know that that should be the real price of the Thai baht versus dollars. But on, on shore in Thailand, we force everyone to transact at one baht, one dollar. Well, we don't force, but we have a mechanism where you can do this at the Bank of Thailand. So we have two different rates, okay? When you want to exchange dollars versus Thai baht in Thailand and outside Thailand, it's two very different rates. And here in Argentina, even in Argentina, the programmer Arun was working with um, received money in US dollars, but when he or they exchange it to uh, Argentina, so they get much less compared to the, the market rate because it went through the banking system. So the, um, he came up with the idea that a dollar should be a dollar wherever, wherever it goes. So why is it that a dollar has two prices in Argentina? That's just weird. Can we create a system where a dollar is always a dollar? The blockchain has no, has no rules like that, right? It's always connected. But the problem is in the blockchain, there is no such thing as a true stable coin that is decentralized. Because a stable coin that we saw earlier is a just information created on a blockchain but when you create it, how do you know you can exchange it for one unit, one dollar? The model that we see, like Tether, for example, and they hold assets outside the blockchain. But do we really know that they hold US dollar asset in the same amount as the coins that they have? Because uh, they don't open themselves up for people to audit them. They say they have enough US dollars. Don't worry about it. But that's all they say. People try to say, People try to ask to see evidence. They say, I'm not going to give you full evidence, but just trust me, I have it. Okay. So you still require trust. <clears throat> Remember, this is meant to be a trustless system. You don't need to trust. You can verify yourself. So Rune said, what if we need to have a dollar that has enough value to back behind it? What do we do? What if we create a system that we can create a stable coin that looks like a dollar, right? But the way to create it, you have to borrow. And you have to borrow that stable coin. Suppose I have $200 worth of Ether. That's a native coin with even blockchain. I have $200 worth of Ether. I can create a stable coin for you. I will create you a stable coin as a loan. Okay? If you borrow money from us, fantastic. You can borrow it as long as you have enough collateral. Put in 200 collateral, I'll give you a $100 loan. And that loan is going to be given out as a token called DAI, stable coin. Okay, so here we guarantee the exchange rate. You want to get a stable coin, you get one coin, one dollar. They'll issue you, okay, one coin at one dollar. But the problem is, if we can buy this coin at one dollar, can we sell the coin at one dollar? You can sell the coin in the open market if you like. Just like, you know, um, the Thai baht, you can also sell the a Thai baht in open market. But is there a place that guarantees that you can, you can sell the stable coin at exactly one unit, one dollar? Because if you have places where you can always buy or sell at one unit, one dollar, uh, you can arbitrage okay, across the two places to make sure that if other markets, we have different prices, you can always come back to the market maker here that guarantees one unit, one dollar. So this is how they design it. Um, you can always... Um, you can always sell DAI back at one unit, one dollar. Okay. And if you're worried about people not willing to come back and sell DAI, well, you didn't really buy the coin, you borrowed the coin. 
if you borrow the coin, you're gonna come back and repay. Because after all, if you don't repay the coin, one, there's gonna be interest, okay? And two, you're never gonna get back your collateral. Remember, to create, it, to create 100 units of the coin, you actually borrow. And you put in collateral worth more than what you borrow. So this is a genius system that allows, that, that allows you to have um, participants in the system who will come okay, to buy the coins and who will come to sell the coins. Because if there's no one who wants to come and buy and sell the coins at the $1, there's no, like, uh, there's no arbitrage in the system. Okay, so I'm summarizing a lot of ideas here. But this is essentially um, borrowing the mechanisms that we use for lending to create a stable coin. And by doing so, this DAI stable coin is actually backed up okay, by a loan that is on chain, fully on chain, as opposed to having a stable coin like USDT that's backed up by a dollar asset outside the blockchain, which nobody can see. Here, everyone can see that. There are loans that are being created that are backed by some collateral. Everything is fully on the blockchain. Okay? So sometimes people call DAI a decentralized stable coin because it's a stable coin that fully leverages the functions of the programmable blockchain to make sure that all the operations is transparent, observable on chain. You don't have to trust anything. As long as you are okay with the way the code works, you don't even need to know who your counterparty is. Okay, whereas for USDT stablecoin, you're actually placing a lot of trust in the issuer of USDT that if you want to redeem your stablecoin, there will actually be dollars. And if you try to redeem stablecoins and that's not enough dollars, well, that's like Northern Rock. Okay, you try to withdraw money from a bank, that's not enough money from a bank. Banks can be in trouble. Same thing with USDT. You can try to draw, withdraw money from USDT. If they don't have enough money, they can also be in trouble. They're supposed to, okay? but you know, we can never be sure because they never let anyone to go and fully certify what they have. Okay, any question? So the idea is to create a stable coin okay, without relying on anything but quotes on the blockchain. So if we have quotes on the blockchain that says somebody has some collateral, they can put that collateral in and then borrow money they use the word mint because we're creating new coin, creating new token is called minting. Just like how um, the royal mint in different countries create coins, coinage for the, for the, um, for the uh, financial system. And then when they say burn is because they go back and then they repay the loan. So the, when the stable coins are used to repay the loan, the system puts that out of circulation and then release back the token again. And if you are, a little bit confused about how this works. This is actually how modern banking works. Okay? When you borrow money from the bank, suppose you want to buy a house, 10 million baht. How would you like to get your money? Would you like cash? Or would you prefer a bank transfer? You prefer transfer, right? You don't like cash because cash is cumbersome. And that is fantastic news for the bank because if the bank if you, if you say you want to get 9 million baht in cash, the bank has to find bank notes worth five, 9 million baht and give to you. But if you want to borrow money and then you're okay with getting a bank balance, the bank can say, now you have 9 million baht in the bank account. They just created 9 million baht okay, into your bank account. But the reason why they want to create this money which is actually dead, dead to you, okay? They owe you 9 million. They want to create this because they have a 9 million baht asset as a loan to you. So you know, more their asset liability grow at the same amount. But they just minted 9 million baht worth of money into your bank account. So when you try to go back and repay the loan, you pay 9 million baht plus interest, okay? To get your house released on the mortgage, they say, pay me 9 million plus interest. They receive the money, Okay, by reducing 9 million baht from your account, right? And they say, okay, your loan to us is now settled, but your 9 million is also gone. So they just burn 9 million baht plus interest in that bank account to settle your debt to them. 
exactly the same system. Okay, but this is being done via tokens on a blockchain instead. You put up collateral, they will put money in your bank account. They will create money. Okay, when you repay your loan, they destroy the money. Yeah, and you get your collateral back. Yes. Why can't they just spend Ethereum directly and instead of doing this? Exchange rate is not stable. It's spending Ethereum is like spending Bitcoin for pizza, right? But if you spend dollars and you think dollars is more vol less volatile, then you can you can be a little bit more, a little bit more um, happy or a little bit more um, uh, I would say assured that I wouldn't regret spending in either versus spending in, in dollars. People talk about this because, uh, because um, many times when we spend money, the people receiving the money are still thinking in terms of dollars or bucks, okay? And when we spend in terms of uh, Bitcoin or Ether. So going back to the days where you spend money early, like Bitcoin, 10 years on, you might regret. If you spend dollars to buy pizza, 10 years on, you probably don't think so much because the rate of change is there. There may be inflation. But it's not going to hit you as hard, okay? When when uh, the exchange rate is that volatile, okay? So they just wanted to create the stable coin, but there is no way to create that stable coin easily yet at that point in time. So they wanted to make sure that there will be demand. This is a recurring theme because when you build things on decentralized finance, the idea is that you want to encourage interaction with users. So that the interactions work out in a way that benefits or uh, serves the way that you want to, 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 um, to do. So your objective was to create a, a token or a coin that maps to the US dollars. But you're worried that if people say buy this US dollar coin, is there going to be someone who sells US dollar coin? They don't know, right? So they do this by a loan instead. This will create an incentive that if somebody buys a coin as a loan, they will sell back the coin as a loan repayment. Okay. This will also create demand for them to buy stable coins to repay the loans as well. Okay, so that we just explained this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, talk about the easy point. The reason why this is easy to do is because um you know banks ask for collateral for you uh, when uh, for you when you borrow money. Is because they're not really sure. Try borrowing 9 million from the bank without collateral. They're going to charge you a really high interest. Okay? But if you borrow 9 million from the bank to buy a house and use that house as collateral, they're willing to reduce interest rate for you because um, it, uh, they, they're worried about your ability to pay, number one. Okay? You might not have enough money to pay. If you borrow 9 million cash as a clean loan, they're not sure whether you have enough money to repay in the future. If you, buy, if you borrow money to buy a house, Okay. They can seize the house and sell the house easily. But the point I want to focus on is actually number two, willingness. Even if your house is valuable, they cannot take the house away without a legal arrangement in a mortgage document that says, look, if I put my name as a mortgage, uh, mortgagee, I think, mortgagee, I'm not sure exactly the terms, but I, I'm a bank, I put my name on your, on your ownership document. You cannot sell that land or that property unless my name is gone. Okay, I block you from transferring. This means even if you don't want to pay, okay, I have a way to, uh, to force you to repay me. That is why banks only accept certain types of collateral. Number one is valuable. Okay, the real estate is more valuable than other types of assets. And number two, it's easy for them to seize that collateral. So you might have heard a lot about margin loans in Thailand, like share pledgings and so on. Why is it the securities company are willing to give you, give you loans to buy sec other securities based on um, assets you pledge as margin? Because securities are, are financial contracts that you can transfer ownership very easily. If I want to take away your uh, stocks that you pledge as collateral, you already signed an agreement with me that if you don't, if you don't make any payment, I can take your stock and then sell to, to settle for money, okay, a margin loan. So in, a, in essence, this is a bit like a margin loan. You put up collateral, either collateral, okay? And you get 
a credit balance that you can borrow. And then you can borrow out as long as you remain within that balance. And if your balance goes down too much, if your collateral value compared to your loan goes down too much, they will start asking you, can you post more collateral, please? If you don't post more collateral, they will take away your asset and then sell the asset to settle the loan. Okay, so it's exactly the same mechanism as a margin loan, security margin loan. And the security margin loan is exactly the same mechanism as a real estate loan, except that the collateral, the ease of uh, repossessing the collateral to repay is very different. When you build this on chain, it's very easy because you can write a smart contract that says, well, if your loan compared to, the, compared to the collateral value, the loan to value ratio is too high, if you don't put in collateral, I will take away your collateral automatically using a smart contract. Very easy to do. Okay? You already gave the permission to the provider to take away your collateral if you don't put in additional margin. So there's a big similarity okay, between what is going on in decentralized finance, institutional finance, especially in securities, um, securities uh, business. And then if you go into like the financial, uh, not the programming contracts behind it, um, you find that you know, that dependencies between different financial, different, um, not financial, the programming functions to interact with one another to make sure that um, you know, they can check the loan to value ratio, okay? They can check the, the loan balance, they can check the states and so on. And then if something happens, they can, they can uh, manage the risk and then seize the collateral to, to repay the loans. So you don't need to uh, be worried about this, but I wanna show you that some of the developers behind um, financial services like this, they give you a big overview, a very transparent overview of how their um, programming logic works because they're built based on the, the ethos that on the blockchain, everything's transparent. So you don't need to trust me. You can look yourself. This is how the contracts, how the codes are written. And if you want to, want to check how the codes are written, you can be satisfied that whatever I tell you up here is actually what is being coded directly okay, onto the blockchain. So you don't have to trust me. You can verify that what I say is exactly encoded in the programming logic. Okay, more importantly, you don't even need to know who I am. As long as you trust my code and my code works, that should all, be, that, should all um, that really matters, okay? So around then, around 2021, people started writing about, you know, these um, programming logics that allow us to, to create new financial services. So here's a paper written by uh, authors at University of Warwick, okay, about the centralized stable coin and whether these collateral that we see they put in, actually um, the risk actually influence the way these stable coins operate. Okay. Um, fast over three years on, Warwick has a, very, uh, has a very active center on FinTech that uh, looks into decentralized finance, thanks to these researchers that began working on this idea at that point in time, in July, 2021, June, July. Same thing with me. I started writing, writing papers on this in June and July 2021 too. I started, re I started learning how to look into the blockchain data, how the contracts work, what transactions are being done. So this is like a network diagram of how different addresses and different contracts um, interact on the blockchain and where the stable coins are being created, are transferred to and used. Okay, so this is a, another type of research that we can do other than looking at a price series we can look at the interactions between different uh, programming addresses, okay, um, and the types of financial activities being um, conducted between different entities on the blockchain. And then around that point in time, there have been talks about how to create various types of stable coins, okay? Some types of stable coins, these are logos of stable coins that have assets that are off chain, like Tether, USDC, for example. Okay, and DAI is an, uh, a type of stable coin that has assets are fully on chain. Then there have been discussions about alternative ways of creating stable coins that doesn't require you to borrow money. Because if you have to borrow money, going back to this, it looks like it's pretty inefficient to create 100 units of a DAI. You need to have $200 worth of a collateral to create something that has half the value. Okay? People start talking about efficiency. To create stable coins, you need to have capital upfront to create stable coins. To, to, so to have stable coins circulate in the system, 
we need to have a lot of people willing to borrow and put up asset as collateral. So there might be insufficient stable coins in circulation for, for practical uses. So there have been people who discuss about what else can we do in order to create okay, new, new stable coins to use. And narratives like algorithmic stable coins started arising. Okay? So that's like, you know, this logo is a, a UST, okay, Terra stable coin. Okay, you can start seeing where this is going. Okay, this is a 2021, by the way. So there was this stable coin okay, that um, created from using one stable coin as collateral, and then they use another token they create themselves okay, as another, I wouldn't say collateral, but another ingredient. Okay, so let, let, me, let me go back one step. Previously, die stable coin require you to borrow, okay? and then you go back and repay. And I would say borrowing has two, two downsides. One is um, it's inefficient, you need to borrow. And two, there's a cost. Okay, to create it, you need to pay interest to create it. So that's a burden for people who want to create new supply of these stable coins. But if stable coins are necessary, should we find ways to make it more efficient or less costly? So say, why not just sell stable coins instead? If stable coins are now popular, why not sell stable coins in exchange for something? Okay. So one way to sell stable coins in exchange for other assets. The thing is, if you sell stable coins in exchange for other assets, you are the market maker, right? You might make a loss or gain as a market maker if you sell stable coin for ether, for example, right? Another, another, another option is to sell a stable coin in exchange for another stable coin, okay? Which is what they do. But it's kind of defeating the purpose. If you want to create one stable coin, why do you require buying this stable coin with another stable coin, right? Why not use that original stable coin instead? So they create a mixture. Okay? So they, they create a, a rule that says, I want to uh, I wanna sell you stable coin using uh, this kind of ratio. If you want $1 worth of stable coin that I create, bring me 75% of another stable coin okay? and bring me 25% of a coin that I create. And with this ratio, I can give you uh, a stable coin I want. And why, this is, why, why, do, why do they sign it like this? Because um, the, the, the asset that they have to hold is a stable coin, which is okay. I mean, it's safe, right? Um, it's, if you buy $1, you sell back at $1, no risk to you. The other asset that you use, if you use Ether or other, other coins, it's risky. You don't, want to be in, you, want, you don't want to be holding that as inventory. So I use an asset that I can create myself. So, you know, if you need more of that asset, I can always create more of that asset to give to you. Kind of sounds silly, right? But that's how it works, okay? And you can see where this is going. So they created this, and then um, in a matter of say, 16, 17 days, okay, this, this stable coin blew up, even though it has 75% stable coin backing it, it still blew up. Okay, I started built on this another another program. Okay, so you know I started writing research papers on this too. Okay, in two thousand twenty one, and then I was kind of giving hints that by the way, there's another stable coin that is not even backed up by any stable coin at all. It's backed up hundred percent by something they totally made up. You know, but you know it's two thousand twenty one. People were still pretty pretty uh excited about this so I don't want to be going up against the wind so I just tell them maybe you want to have a look at this okay and then um, think look around and see what's going on okay and you know you you know what happens one year after that okay okay now I'm going to go to other things okay um we also saw how that lending was done, and, and, um, but the requirement was that you, you can put up a collateral and then you can borrow. But um, that, that borrowing we saw earlier asks you to borrow in stable coins. Sometimes you don't want to borrow in stable coins. Okay? You want to borrow in other digital assets. That's fine. You can also do that, but you need to write a different programming logic. Okay? You need to write a programming logic so that if somebody wants to borrow, say, Ether, which you as a programmer cannot create either yourself, as opposed to die stable coin. You as a programmer, you can create that stable coin yourself. But 
here, they want assets that already exist that you can't create yourself. What do you do if you want to lend? Well, you have to create a pool where you connect people who have excess of some digital tokens that they don't want. They want to put to work, for example, and, and create a pool so that they can deposit those excess tokens in return for some interest. And on the other hand, if you have someone who wants to borrow those excess tokens, they can do so, but they got to pay interest. Okay, so this is like going back to traditional or medieval banking. Medieval banking means um, money back then in medieval times is coins, gold coins. If you want to borrow gold coins, I cannot create gold coins for you. I have to go find gold coins to lend to you. Okay, whereas modern banking, you want to borrow money, um, you're happy to accept bank balance, I can mint money in bank balance for you, no problem. Okay, but when you repay, I burn that away. But for gold coins, I don't mint, I don't burn. I find, I, in, I intermediate. And when you return the money when you borrow, that money, I also owe the depositors as well. When they withdraw money, they really do want the gold coins they deposit. Okay, you can build this and make a pool that connect the two sides. You can write computer programs to make sure that the rate of return that you get and the rate of return that you charge works in a way that you as a, as a middleman, right? You're never going to get hurt. Okay? You're going you're gonna to charge interest on people who borrow. You're going to take a cut of that and whatever that remains, you pay out to depositors. So you're always going to profit. You can never lose money. Unlike banks that fix the, borrow, fix the deposit rate. Okay? They borrow money and they also pay money based on the money they create as interest, but they fix that rate of return. But their income, though, is uncertain. Uncertain for two reasons. Okay? Uh, they may charge different rates, and there's also credit risk. But if you connect a pool together, you can manage credit risk just like how these guys manage credit risk by asking for a huge collateral. If you ask for enough collateral, you can, you can protect yourself quite well. Okay? So they don't suffer credit risk. And they change their interest rates in a way that they're always going to earn more than they pay out. So you can end up creating a financial lending service that never lose money. You only just going to make a lot of money when there's lots of activity or make a little money okay, when there's not a lot of activity. And again, you can do all these by programming logic. And that's how this DeFi lending compound lending works. And again, in September, I wrote another paper because by then I figured out how to read the smart contracts of this, um, of this uh, service. We also, I also look further into who were the ones that start borrowing money. Like, it's an interesting idea, but you know, what were they doing? What were they, what were they borrowing the money for? Okay, I found out that they borrow the tokens to put back in, okay? and then to borrow again. So in, in the stock market, there's a suspicion that a lot of stocks that has high pledge ratio. Pledge ratio means I have 100 stocks outstanding in the market, maybe 30-40% of those stocks are pledged in the margin accounts. Okay, they're collateral. That's fine, okay, you can put in the asset as collateral. But the thing is, what do you do with the money? If you take out the money, and then you buy the stocks again, what happens when you buy a stock? Price goes up, right? When the price goes up, uh, your margin um, credit line expands. Borrow more money, what do you do? Buy the same stock. Do it again, 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 again. That's exactly what's happening. <laughs> okay. Um, because who are borrowing? Sales network. You might not be aware of this. Alameda Research, what if I told you he's affiliated? Well, he is owned by Sam Bankman Free. Okay. And Three Arrows Capital, Three Arrows Capital, they're the hedge funds based in, 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 um, in Singapore. Okay. Um, run by Carl Davis and Chu Chu. And um, they have a theory of a. Uh, crypto asset super cycle. There's always going to be a super cycle. What were they doing? <laughs> they were borrowing money to buy more digital assets, like, you know, <laughs> circular loop. And this is, a, this is a beauty of decentralized finance, right? If you do these transactions on the blockchain, well, everything is visible on a blockchain if, they, if you know who they are. Okay? Took, took a bit of investigative work, but eventually you can find out who they are. Okay, so we can read more of these papers. So now both, both of these papers have been published, by the way. So 
uh, that was the work I was doing. Um, lockdown, nothing to do, right? So I spent my days looking to blockchain, reading smart contracts, looking at addresses, who own them, and so on and so on. There were interesting things going on because uh, one of the metrics that people talk about in financial in decentralized finance is total value locks. And what this means is the, the value of digital assets being locked into smart contracts. For example, if I borrow stablecoin from DAI, I will need to lock my collateral. That counts as total value locks. Okay? If I want to borrow from Compound, I skip this. They also ask me to put up collateral. Okay? I need to lock my collateral in there. I need to be a depositor and a borrower at the same time. Okay? That total value lock becomes a metric to measure activities in decentralized finance. And people are focusing on total value locks. That's an incentive to encourage the growth of that total value. You can call this growth hacking if you like. So what do I do to encourage growth hacking? Maybe I give out digital coupons to those who participate. So I could imagine I give coupons if you deposit okay, tokens with me. I give you coupons if you borrow tokens from me. Okay, and those coupons are easy to create. We saw earlier, right? These are just numbers you can write on the blockchain, ERC20. So this is precisely what Compound did. They started giving out these digital coupons okay, in June of 2020 for people who deposit and people who borrow. So another activity that people were doing back then, if you deposit and you borrow, you get reward both ways. The direct cost of lending net the cost of depositing is designed to be negative, right? You need to pay money to borrow. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Okay? But once you add in these digital coupons that they give, the rate is positive. Okay? You can do a delta neutral strategy. You deposit stable coin, you borrow stable coin. Okay? So the net rate is negative. You have to pay. But if you add in the coupons, it's positive. So that's an arbitrage here. As long as you can sell those coupons at a price, it turns out those coupon price skyrocket as well. Okay. That's another thing people were doing. They were, they were identified it. That's a delta neutral strategy here. It's an arbitrage, it's a money printing machine. As long as these coupons I, I receive can be sold somewhere. Okay. This is called yield farming. I figured out a rule. I figured out where they can maximize those yield and more advanced version. I can even do delta neutral hedge. Fantastic. Okay. But it requires, it requires someone buying the coupons from you. And those coupons, they don't really mean anything. Okay? They give you the voting rights, but nobody buys a voting right without a cash flow right. You look at the, you look at the share price of Google. right? Google has two stock classes. Well, it's called Alphabet now, but you know, the symbols are still like Google. They have to shoot two share classes. The first share class, you get both dividends and, and voting. Second share class, you get only dividends, no voting. So to figure out how much people are willing to pay to vote, all you need to do is look at the difference between the two, right? Would you like to guess what's the difference? Zero. Yeah, <laughs> zero. Nobody cares about voting. If you're a minor shareholder, you don't care about voting. You care about, you care about dividends, right? These tokens only give you the right to vote, but no cash flow. We call it governance token. Why we have to call it governance token? Well, if I give, a, if I give out empty tokens without the right to vote, people figure out it's a blank. Right? So I give you something. You give the right to vote, but it's not exactly a share. You don't get dividends. But it, it gives you right, something to, 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 to um, anchor yourself to that, oh, this token, this coupon is worthwhile somehow. Okay? But its intrinsic value is a different issue. Okay? You can also think about why don't they just give you the cash flows out as dividends? Well, they could. If they want to do it, then the SEC said, wait a minute, that's like an equity security, isn't it? You issue a security without consulting me? Sorry, that's illegal. Please come. <laughs> okay? So they're stuck, they're stuck in like a, a stalemate, right? They, they give out a right that's not worth much, but if they want to give out the full right, they're also in trouble too. But in any case, if you don't care, you can sell, you can buy. So with these Intensive coupon incentivization, the TVL skyrocketed. 
in fact, you know, the moment the, the moment this this um, news came out, like within a within a week, this like Delta neutral strategy was being posted everywhere. So people are smart; they figured out. Okay. Second case study, AirDrop. Okay, that's a that's an application that allows you to exchange uh, different digital assets uh, via smart contracts. Okay, and um, they figured out that they want to reward people for past participation. Okay, so you, people have been exchanging all these tokens. So great, I want to reward you. What do I reward them with? I reward them with coupons. Again, coupons with a right to vote, but no cash flow. Same reason. Okay, once I give the cash flow, I'm in trouble with SEC. So I give you um, the coupon to vote instead governance token. And you can call governance because you can vote on the changes, but you don't receive any share. Again, this became a very popular way to incentivize people to use because you know the more you use, the more coupons you get. But comp, sorry, a comp is uh, the name of the coupon, right? Um, because the, com the platform is called Compound. This is a way of rewarding ongoing activity, but this is a way of rewarding uh, past activity. And these two things, like yield farming and airdrop farming becomes a widespread in decentralized finance. So this, going back to what I told you earlier at the beginning of the class that one of my ex-students told me my cousin got really rich, they were airdrop farming and they were yield farming, okay, on various platforms. So the total value locked skyrocketed in 2000, late 2020. So that was when I was being told, okay, here about being told. Again, if you can go back in time, there are two moments now I can go back in time. The first one was that high school student who talked, asked me about Bitcoin. And the second moment in time was uh, late 2020 when my ex student told me about DeFi. Okay, I looked, but I didn't buy. So I thought it's going to blow up at some point. Well, it did. It, it did, but it, it blew up much later. And even accounting for the blowing up part, it's still growing up. And we'll see a little bit why that happens. Okay? So more details, if you like, you can read this paper. Uh, the BIS, Bank for International Settlements, took a great deal of interest in this. Another group of researchers that's very active on this is there. Okay? They're based in Switzerland. They're based in Basel, I think. Okay? And um, they've been writing papers on this um, for a long, long time. And then the group of researchers who will finalize, finally uh, publish a full um, paper in the, I think it's called Digital Finance Journal. This was basically a working paper that was turned into, turned into a um, full-fledged research paper afterward. Now, I'm gonna go back again to 2021 about my research interest. I started drawing pictures like this. What I noticed was that, okay, we started seeing change okay, of, of, of our actions. I start with Ether. I put Ether as collateral. Okay? I get DAI back as a loan. I put DAI into a, a, a sub-platform and I get a receipt from that. And I can put a receipt on that into another platform. Wait a minute, it looks like if I start off with just say some amount of Ether, I can use that amount to repetitively, okay, recursively doing transactions in DeFi. And what if total value lock counts every level, okay? or putting the assets in. This is recursive. It all started from just this amount, but you put it in once, it counted once, put it in twice, counted twice, counted, put it in a third time, counted three times. The same amount being repeated over and over and over again. And this can happen because in DeFi, once you have these digital tokens, anyone can build an app that says, please come to us, we'll accept those tokens into our platform and then we reward you by doing so. And the network grows more complicated, okay? That period I told you that people started airdrop farming, yield farming was like June 2020. This is what the world of DeFi looked like, okay? And one year on, in June 2022, this is what the world of DeFi looked like. You try to do, to do it for today, this world gets more complicated. It also works across multiple blockchains as well. Okay, this picture I created in, in uh, September 2021. Okay. Back then I started noticing that it's you know, I don't think people started looking yet. Okay, the reason is because it's manual. You know, I spent like a month trying to find out all these addresses. What are they doing? I look at them manually. Okay. 
instead, I didn't have a research assistant. I did everything by myself. So it's nice that you can do this, but it's so cumbersome. So that was like the kind of post I, was, I started putting out on social media back then. Okay? I also, also started developing teaching materials already. So I'm going to skip all this. You can have a look at these and also you know, maybe share with you some of the social media posts back then. But fast forward, this was Monday. Okay, this was Monday. This is a, a conference by June, a company that specialized in blockchain analytics, trying to make sure that if you want to look at what's going on in blockchain, it becomes um, easier and more user-friendly. So now if you want to do research in blockchain, it's easy because all that labeling and deciphering the course is done by this company. It's easy to solve as long as you have the financial resources to subscribe to that service. And they're, they're, not, they're not that expensive, so that's good. So this was the, the discussion that um, uh, they were saying that the current measures of adoption, for example, total value locked and so on, are, are flawed. Precisely the reasons we noticed in DeFi two years ago, okay? But it wasn't easy to come out and, and say things like this because people were busy doing other things or there were not enough interest in blockchain analysts looking at these um, kind of things uh, as opposed to looking at which platform is going to take off, which coin is going to rise, and so on. Okay, so this you know require another another um, uh, frame of question that uh, led you into this kind of analysis. Around then August, okay, we're still in 2021, by the way. Okay, around then in August, uh, the chair of the SEC started uh, putting out notices like, you know, this is basically a wild west. If you don't do something, I worry a lot of people will be hurt. But even if you put out warnings, that's nothing that you can do. Why? Because this is an open internet. It's a decentralized network. It's made in a way that even if you try to shut it down, you can always build it up again. Okay? Like, like I told you earlier, BitTorrent network, you can try to shut it down. It will, it will be back up again as long as someone is running that BitTorrent software. It doesn't matter which client version. Okay? As long as you run the software that secures the network itself, it will be active, it will be alive. So here's Dan Elitzer, the co-founder of Ideal Collab Ventures um, in 2020, okay, talking about why they were interested in this world. Well, there might be hacks, exit scams, short-term asset prices, and so on. It's even possible the whole thing might come crashing down, but even then, it will be rebuilt because even if you want to prevent it from being rebuilt, you cannot stop it from being rebuilt. It is an open source, open world. So, you know, so these are reflect kind of you know my 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 uh, collection of uh, ideas that I started putting back then before I have all these courses and books and so on. Okay, so I'm going to skip all these. You can read the details yourself. Now, fast forward to May 2020, and and all these happen. Okay, all these happen. Why? Because just like any financial systems, okay, the financial system, whether it's built on blockchain or whether it's built on paper. It's a double-edged sword. Okay? It's a chain of asset and liability relationship. And you have an over-leverage. If you have a concentration of leverage, if you have fragility, it's a matter of time okay, before things come crumbling down. It happens. It's not the first time. It won't be the last time either. Financial history is full of opportunities and crises like this. Okay? So what I want to point out was that you know, if you look, you would know. Okay? The only time is when. Just like the big shots, that scene, okay, how do you know this is happening? Well, because I looked. If you look, you would know. Okay? And then the next step is, can you, can you um, be convicted long enough for that event to happen? Because you recall scenes in the big shot that, um, that even uh, Mark Baum's hedge fund okay, was even being uh, reprimanded for the actions they were taking. It's very imprudent. They were consuming a lot of capital resources betting against the housing market. But you know, the fundamentals don't lie. If you have an overextended uh, system, a fragile system with lots of leverage, it's a matter of time before it, before it crumbles, crumbles. I was uh, attending a workshop by Professor Brian Class from UCL earlier who wrote a, a book, uh, Fluke. Okay? And he mentioned something that is uh, very interesting. Um, he, he called it a sand pile. So that's like an idea in physics that uh, you know, when you, when you pour sand to get uh, into, into a ground, it, it will be a pile, right? And 
every pile at some point will crumble down. But which grain of sand is going to trigger that pile? You don't know. Okay, but you do know that when it builds up, okay, when it builds up, um, it only takes like one grain of sand to create a whole avalanche of that sand pile. So same thing. Okay, if you push a system to a limit, it's like building up that sand pile. If the sand pile gets bigger, bigger, and bigger, it becomes more fragile, fragile, and fragile. Maybe just one sand, one grain of sand can actually cause the whole system trigger to, to go down. And I think this is precisely that. Okay, it would, the leverage was built up so much that one big event happening there was the one that flipped the system for a long, long time. We saw earlier that in May, in May 2021, a stable coin that is even safer than that collapsed already. Okay, so one year on, the risky stable coin also collapsed. But that time, the connection was already widespread so that it uh, led it, it kind of um, spread out into the whole financial system too. So people started writing about what happened in that Terra Luna case, um, looking at the so now blockchain analytics, okay, looking inside the addresses about who owned what now becomes more mainstream. So um, Professor Igor Makarov and Tony Shaw are also top scholars um, at MIT and at London School of Economics. They also now work with looking into the blockchain data and the address ownership themselves. And by that time, a lot of my uh, projects started in 2021, have already been published. Um, some took a long time, uh, some are faster than others. But the point is, um, all these okay, are about uh, looking into the seemingly new world, okay, but using a very traditional framework of analyzing. Because my belief is that financial services, financial systems, despite all the innovations that we see, the fundamental issues in finance remains the same. Okay? We want to make transfers, we want to make payments, we want to hold ownership, we want to have intermediation of funds across different states of time. The challenges remain the same, but how we overcome them, okay? can sound a little bit different, but the core ideas are exactly the same. Right now, regulators are more worried about you know, how these risks can build up because it takes a crisis to, to, be, to, be, um, to be pushed into action. Okay? The 2008 financial crisis also spurred a lot of uh, new regulatory frameworks. And just like a 1929 stock market crash, also ushered in a whole new era of financial market regulations. So IOSCO is a, like, a, an organization for the Securities Commission like SEC in the world to come and meet. They issued about things uh, in decentralized finance that they uh, worry about, okay? um, I think in December 2023, about last year. And earlier this year, in September, I was able to go with the SEC Thailand to give the insights about what we learned from the research papers that we've done in the past with them together. So where are we at now? Okay, we're still looking at how to understand the interconnectedness of financial leverage. So I'm still working a little bit okay, in this field, uh, looking at um, if you build banking services on blockchain, okay, are there ways to detect the systemic risks in the system? And this same idea, um, the people at the Bank of International Settlement are also working on. Okay, so I'll be, I'll be looking at the interconnectivity between different services and uh, the users, the borrowers, the depositors, and so on. And the, um, the Bank of the National Settlement now, is a, they have a project that want to map okay, the whole world of decentralized finance. And there are also researchers that look at how this network is being used to inter intermediate illicit funds. For example, you've heard of pick butchering scams. Uh, this is not limited to Thailand. It's a global phenomenon. Uh, regulators in Australia have set up task force, so does um, Singapore. Um, and uh, there are a couple of groups of researchers, one at University of Texas, looking at the chains of how the funds are being intermediated across the blockchain via stable coins and also the um, exchange involved. There's another one um, by university researchers at um, Munich, Munich as well, Techn Technical University of Munich, too. So you can see decentralized finance with that blow up, discussions around decentralized finance has been a little bit more limited because people now, people now start realizing that if unchecked, there can be a lot of risk built up. The flip on the other side, okay, Bitcoin is built for different purpose. Okay? Bitcoin is built for just for international transfers. You can't build all these smart program logics on Bitcoin network itself. So comparatively, um, they enjoy a different clientele of, uh, of uh, 
users and investors. So the key event in the world of Bitcoin probably was in January this year that the SEC approved the issuance of um, Bitcoin spot ETF. You might have seen ETFs in several classes. So these are like, you know, uh, specialized structures that allow you to hold either direct assets themselves or hold investment strategies. So previously you were able to buy Bitcoin ETFs, but they were not direct Bitcoins. They were strategies that are, have exposure to Bitcoin, like futures, for example. And with this, um, I should in a new class of investors, and we also saw a conversion of a previous trust that were giving access to Bitcoin, converting to ETFs as well. So today, for many cryptocurrencies, are probably less about censorship resistance compared to the early days where it was created, but it's become more like an alternative asset class that people think about for portfolio diversification. So for those of you looking to take CFA certifications, right now, um, digital asset is also part of CFA content, um, part of the alternative investment, and alternative investment as a whole has expanded. So when I took my CFA exam long, long time ago, it was only about 5% of the exam. Now it's about 10%. So if you're taking a CFA level one, your 180 questions, probably about 18 to 20 questions will be on alternative investment. That'll be like private equity, real estate, commodities, including digital assets as well. Okay, so I think this is the last slide already. Okay, what is my view on this? Okay, decentralized finance is a double edged sword. Okay, it's built, it's, it's built with computer algorithms that streamlines many operations, it makes things efficient. But the thing is, when you build a decentralized network focusing on privacy, a lot of the issues in the financial system is built on built on uh, ability to trust one another based on reputation, for example, okay? But a world that preserves privacy also throws away the ability to establish reputation based on identity as well. So uh, Professor um, Paul Krugman, okay, was invited to speak at the and recent Horowitz A16C conference in 2018. And obviously, you know, from traditional economist point of view, he's a skeptic. So one of the, one of the he, he talks about a lot of things about why say Bitcoin might not be a good currency. But one, one of the things that I find fascinating was that he explicitly mentioned this, that this system, in addition to being built as a system that connects everyone to one another, is built on the central idea that we, are, we, we should be able to keep privacy. And if you prioritize privacy, that's gonna be uh, throwing away one of the most important aspects of financial system because you cannot build a repeated game based on the world where you cannot guarantee that you are interacting with the same person over and over again. Okay, you might have heard or you might have read a book like Infinite Games by Simon Sinek, right? About, you know, that's basically trust. If you think about game theory from a one-shot perspective versus game theory from infinite game perspective, the dominant strategies are very different, okay? If I'm only gonna meet you once, I'm not gonna be very willing to cooperate with you. But if we're gonna meet over and over again, there's several classes, strategies that you can use that in the end, you can encourage a more co cooperative outcome. So that's one of the limitations, one of the challenge that if you uh, wanna build financial services based on this you know, open, decentralized, privacy-preserving blockchain, that's something that the developers need to figure out whether they can find ways to address uh, these shortcomings or not. Because otherwise, if you're wondering why all the loans need to be fully collateralized, because if I don't know who you are, then I'm gonna throw away that information. I'm just gonna count you based on your collateral instead. Then I don't need to ask who you are. If your collateral is ether and it's valuable, I'll interact with you. If you don't have any collateral, I won't interact with you. That's great if you have collateral, if you put on the hats of financial inclusion, most of the problems with financial inclusion is that our potential is about the future, okay? But collateral is about the present. So if your present doesn't allow you to interact, your future also doesn't really matter, okay? In this world. So blockchain is built on the past and the present, but because of this lack of identity, the willingness to trust someone about the future isn't there. Just like the, just like the white paper we saw, this is a system, okay, that doesn't require you to trust anyone 
And it was also a system that also encourages you to trust no one. So in a world without trust, it's good for some purposes, okay? But for intertemporal intermediation, that trust is one of the best solutions. Uh, you know, we probably need to figure out a way, okay, to, to make this work. Okay, so that's it. So thank you very much for your time.